All right, thank you for joining me on this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marla Wilson. Thank you for joining me. Appreciate you for joining me this evening. We are excited for this one because this one is going to be an open discussion concerning open theism. And I am so thankful for you guys joining me this evening. And so as you can tell, my voice is a little raspy. I have, I don't know, I, I don't feel sick or anything like that, but my voice is still a little raspy. So please bear with my voice here. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna have an open discussion. I'm excited for this one. Uh, this is gonna be concerning open theism. And I have Chris Fisher and I have Warren McGrew with me and we're going to have a fantastic discussion. So right now, I would you like, if you guys want to come in to the discussion, um, you guys can just ask me in the live chat if you guys want to come in i'll send you a link to join the uh the, join the studio and then i'll get you on to to go back and forth with warren and chris concerning open theism right um so don't be bashful they don't bite they ain't gonna crucify you they ain't gonna throw you under the bus they ain't gonna do none of that right they ain't gonna hurt you right so this is just a, just a fun discussion that we're gonna have concerning open theism and we're gonna get down to the nitty-gritty and if you guys remember warren mcgrew and chris fisher chris they both have been on and uh i think last time mass uh uh, I'm, about to call, I'm about to call Warren McGrew Matt Slate because that's a debate I'm thinking about. Last time Warren McGrew has been on uh, in the capacity of a debate was, I think, actually against Mike, Matt Slick. I think it was the last one that he'd been on, and it was concerning total depravity. So if you know uh, Warren McGrew, he goes, he, he goes against Calvinism. So he is very avid in that. He spends a lot of time studying that area of thought. And so I'm thankful for Warren jumping on here. And Chris Fisher, who is going to be his dynamic duel partner here, Chris Fisher jumped on. And the last time, you know, I forget who he debated, but uh, he jumped on and the topic was concerning open theism. I think it was Jonathan, Jonathan Singleton, I believe it is, I think his name is, but who Chris Fisher debated. But nonetheless, it was a great discussion. Discussion, great debate and i'm excited to have these guys back let me bring these guys in so they can introduce themselves to you guys what's up fellas how y'all doing hey hey chris you muted it is a beautiful day all right awesome awesome Thank you guys for joining me, man. I appreciate you guys once again this is going to be a fun topic man fun discussion open theism when you begin to get in these conversations, man, obviously it, it ruffles a lot of feathers. You know, people are not necessarily uh, 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 friendly with the idea of open theism. Uh, so I think you guys are going to have your hands full, personally. I think you guys are going to have your hands full. You guys are going to have a fun time. So we're going to get this thing going. I know you guys, before we, I know you guys want to do like sort of just give a rough draft, pretty much a rough summary of what open theism is, what it entails and things like that. So before I allow you guys to do that, I want you guys to go ahead and introduce yourselves to the audience. Let them know what you do, your YouTube channels, blogs, whatever. Let them know what you do so they can come check you guys out. All right. Uh, start with Warren. Go ahead. And give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Yeah, no, thanks uh, for having me on here, Marlon. I, I appreciate it. It's uh, it's always good to be back here. You're uh, a pleasant individual and a good moderator and um, nothing but good things to say about you other than your Calvinism, you know, the, <laughs> I got I to put a jab in there. Um, but uh, I want to make very clear that I distinguish between the ism and the ist. And so while I may object to some of the claims and entailments and of those particular doctrines, like I do love Calvinists, even though I'm so aggressive sometimes against the ism that it can seem like I'm making it personal. And I really hope that that's not the case. I, I don't want it to be the case tonight. Um, but uh, no, I, I run uh, Idol Killer, a YouTube channel. Uh, we do Christian apologetics. We do philosophy of religion. We do funny and satirical videos and AI stuff and just whatever entertains me at the moment or I think uh, needs to be addressed. We'll do debate responses or critiques of various claims and entailments. We have a, um, and I don't just pick on Calvinists, by the way. Like I love Mike Winger and you know, I've got a 15 part series over there responding to some of the claims he made about um, a penal substitutionary atonement. So we get into different redemptive models. We get into different theories of time, different models of God's omniscience. We get into uh, the anthropology of man, uh, just a lot of interesting stuff over there. But Idol Killer, I-D-O-L Killer, and you can check it out. And, um, you know, but that's that's pretty much me. I'm a, a father of five. I, uh, I'm uh, quickly leaving middle-aged. And, uh, you know, this is what I find uh, enjoyable. It's a 
it's something that I find very rewarding. So I appreciate the opportunity to come in here and discuss, you know, the goodness of God with, uh, with other people. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right, Chris, uh, go ahead and give a quick intro to yourself. Well, I'm the exact opposite. Everything needs to be taken personally. And uh, I have seven kids. And so Warren's a little bit lacking in that department. No, anyways, for real though, I am the author of the book, God is Open. I run the God is Open podcast and uh, I write on the God is Open blog. So just type in God is Open in Google. You'll find basically anything that I do. And I will send digital copies of my book for free for anyone who wants to read that and uh, understand a little bit about basic biblical open theism. My channel, my podcast focuses on early Christianity, uh, early uh, Near East type religion, and the Hellenization or Platonization of Christianity. So we talk about a lot of church fathers and how Platonism slowly incorporated into the church. So a lot of the themes that the blog and the podcast covers will be talked about tonight. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it so much. All right. So we're going to allow you guys to give a rundown of open theism real quick. Just give an understanding. So people in the audience that have a good understanding of what we're going to be discussing tonight. So, uh, you guys have it. Um, and who's going to give it, who's going to give it you, Chris? Yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead. Right. So yeah, right. open theism, it's, it's a weird term, right? Uh, Wikipedia defines it. It says open theism is a theological movement that has developed within Christianity as a rejection of the synthesis of Greek philosophy and Christian theology. Now, this is a very good definition. Norman Geisler, who's no open theist, he's a Calvinist, he writes against open theists. He writes in his anti-open theist work that, quote, classical theism believes that God is the infinite, necessary, uncaused, omnipotent creator of the universe. Conversely, open theists reject, he writes, classical theism's belief in a simple, immutable, non-temporal, purely actual, and fully omniscient, all-knowing God. Of course, Geisler is speaking of the classical idea of omniscience, in which God's knowledge is identical to himself. Geisler then does an excellent job of explaining God's attributes in classical theism. One, aseity, God is pure actuality with no potentiality. Simplicity, Everything that is in God is God. Immutability. God cannot acquire new things. Eternality. God cannot be subject to time. He spends a good deal of time explaining the properties of classical omniscience. He says God has innate, ungenerated, non-discursive, eternal, and unfalsifiable knowledge. God's knowledge is identical to himself. Remember, all that is in God is God. If any of these properties fail, Open theism is correct. What is open theism? For the purposes tonight, any theistic mutalism, any change in God, particularly God's knowledge. If God changes, let's say God becomes flesh. Open theism is true. If God gains knowledge from outside himself, say he listens to a prayer. Open theism is true. If God's knowledge is internally generated, say that God deliberates about what to do with Israel. Open theism is true. If God's state can be altered, say that Moses makes God angry. Open theism is true. If God has relationships, say that God desires worship. Open theism is true. All of these scenarios place God in new situations, generating unique experiences. All of these add potentiality. They add parts. They add dependencies in God. While tonight is not exclusively, exclusively about the Bible, it's obvious that the writers of the Bible we're all open theists. God's power, his potentiality, his innovation, responsiveness, long-suffering, and deep emotions take center stage. God is the living God. While Warren and myself might have differences in our metaphysical models, we are united in affirming the biblical author's understanding of God. Open theism is true because God is alive, eternally free, and inexhaustibly creative. Warren? No. Yeah, just to uh, to briefly, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, to, to briefly add to what Chris said, uh, if there was ever a moment in the life of God where He freely determined anything, then the future has not been eternally settled, and open theism is true. Uh, every mainstream Christian tradition begins by affirming the freedom of God. Uh, both Christian tradition and Scripture teach us that God is free. 
This is known as the independence of God or the freedom of God. As he is free, he could have created or not created. And thus, open theism is true. Uh, there are different models that operate on an open premise. They may differ on metaphysics, as Chris noted. Like asking, is the door 1% open, 25% open, 100% open? But they all agree that for God, the door has not been completely closed for all eternity, as they all affirm the freedom of God. Now, Chris noted there are different metaphysical models for understanding how God's freedom and knowledge work together. One such model, which I affirm, and I'll probably end up having to defend tonight, is uh, dynamic omniscience. And to kind of give you an overview of where I'm coming from on this, to summarize the dynamic omniscient view, you need to affirm three things. Uh, one, you have to affirm that God is omniscient, meaning he is all-knowing, he knows all the facts. There's going to be equivocation as to whether or not all facts are, are settled. We'll get into that. But you need to affirm that God is omniscient. You have to affirm presentism or the dynamic theory of time because there are tensed facts that change their truth value over time. Uh, so this is something that, that God would need to be in keeping with and, and know. And then three, that there is some moment in God's life where the future is truly or alethically open, that the truth values about future contingent propositions are not completely uh, settled. So often we're met with the false claim that to adhere to the freedom of God is to deny he is omniscient. Uh, but this is simply not the case. Uh, it's just an example of begging the question for an eternally settled future where all contingent propositions are eternally settled. And this is the point of contention that we're here to, uh, to debate tonight. So look forward to getting into more of that as, as the debate progresses. But thank you. All right, guys, thank you for that rundown of the position that is going to be discussed tonight. And so we are going to jump right into this discussion. And we have Vocal Malone with us, who is going to be interrogating you guys heavily. Oh, man, nice. Concerning open theism. What's up, Vocab? How you doing, bro? I think you're muted, Vocab. You're muted. On the top of your browser in your URL, you should have a little video icon where you can select your mic. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no, I got it. I just hit I muted myself on purpose when you guys were talking. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I had forgotten that I did, I did it, is all. So, wait, is it is it, just, is it three of us, Marlon? I, I don't fully know what's going on. Is it three of us, and I'm supposed to ask them questions about open theism? Is that the essence? Well, it's a it's an open panel discussion, so people from the audience are going to come flowing in as well as the, as the conversation progresses. I have Manny. Manny is supposed to be on too, but Manny seems to be having some trouble. He logged out, logged back in a couple of times. So the idea is just having an open panel discussion concerning the topic of open theism. So uh, and and Warren and Chris are the representative of the open theist position, if that makes sense. And then who are the representatives uh, for the, I guess the other side? You. Well, you. <laughs> Anybody just me? That, well, it's I'll probably be jumping into I'll probably be jumping into the conversation as well. So you won't be on your lowsome in that in that capacity. But um yeah. other people are supposed to I know Matt Slick said he's gonna join as well, but he hasn't dropped his daughter off as well. So well uh, we have well, a couple other people up in here as yeah, well. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> just I didn't fully know what was going on. That's my fault, uh everybody. But uh it's good to good to see I, I talked to I talk well, I've never talked to we never talked, we just I've seen some of your videos, but of course, we have talked. You came on the smoke room before. Anyways, um, so whenever I see people pushing open theism, you know, it's interesting. I still haven't, I still haven't fully wrapped my head around mm, motivations. I felt like when I first got into this. I feel like the motivations are the same now. I'm not talking. I understand that doesn't make it true or false, but it's more just mm, interesting because because like I remember when uh, the one guy in Minnesota, the scholar oh, uh, Greg, he start yeah Greg he started getting into it. I remember he said it was like pastoral considerations. You know what I'm saying? That was a key thing for him, and then he sort of found it to be biblical, but that was a driving factor. Do you guys feel the same way? Like is uh is why it's important is like the practical element of being able to say, well, you know, God is experiencing this with you. Is that a key, is a key factor in this in any way for you? So, 
Thomas Ord has an article on paths to open theism. There's a lot of variants of open theism out there. And, and so you're going to find like far leftist emotional people who are drawn to like reason, God's love or something like that as a primary motivation. And then you'll find biblical autists like myself and possibly Warren here who are like, I, I, I'm not like an emotional guy. So I just, I don't care about all those practical concerns. I care more about the Bible. And so there, there's different branches. And so it's important to know who you're talking to and why you're talking to them. If you're talking to the that probably probably for emotional reasons and pastoral reasons and Boyd a little bit falls into that camp but if you're talking to like the Walter Bergerman type of open theist it's very much biblical terms and then <clears throat> so so the way how, what's the way you would say you you got there you're saying it has a, it's not the pastoral considerations I'm using that as a broad thing of like no, sort I, of how to shepherd people, you know. No, the practical concerns are secondary for me. So if uh, you look at my book, God is Open, it's a case study in trying to examine historically what the historic opinions of the authors of the Bible actually were without regard to consequences without a regard to systematic theology it's what does the text say on its own as if it was just any other document from history and so i would not say my concerns are practical warren might have a little bit different of a answer for that warren yeah i mean when there's a train coming by so if you hear it that's on my end apologies um and that's not a metaphor there's a literal train behind me um but uh but when I was a Calvinist, I, I had no problem uh, with classical omniscience, uh, that God knows the future, the future is settled. He decreed and determined it in eternity past. I thought that's what the Bible taught. And so that's what I was content believing. And then as I started to see that I had been reading these presuppositions into the text, then I became concerned that Christianity may not be true. I still was committed chiefly to the belief that Christ is God incarnate, that Christ did come, live sinlessly, die, suffer, resurrect, ascend. I still did have a belief that the Bible was true, but I just became keenly aware that I didn't understand it um, apart from reading into it these presuppositions. And so as I began to study the Bible, I saw things like total depravity fall, but I also saw that I had been reading into the text, this idea of these classical attributes where God just simply describes himself in terms that are completely contrary to that, to where if I just go through the list of scripture where God says, this is what I'm like, in order to continue affirming those classical attributes, I would have to dismiss verse after verse after verse after verse as not, not just anthropomorphic, but lacking any uh, truth that's being conveyed by metaphor. Like, you know, um, uh, anytime you're looking at use of language, metaphor is to convey a truth. It's even, even condescending speak is, is to convey a truth. And so as I began to study scripture, I started to realize, wait a minute, uh, God is not like, uh, I had presupposed. So what are the consequences if I actually take some of these self-revelation claims about God in a more strict sense. Doesn't mean everything is wooden literal. It doesn't mean that God has wings, but there are certain things that he says, this is what I'm like, this is what I do. And if I completely dismiss those, what good is scripture? And if I, if I take them on their surface, what does that entail for the rest of my doctrine of God model? And so that's what led me into this. And then I began studying philosophy of time and some other things. I started to see the, the benefits of uh, of it as it relates to um, theodicy and, and the problem of evil. No view escapes the problem of evil unscathed, but I think the open position comes out cleaner. Um, there's no position, you know, that, that escapes um, without having to, to touch on it. But, uh, you know, all of these things, I think, just continue to strengthen my view and position on on the, the fact that the future has not been eternally uh, settled that, that for instance, like you and I are not necessary beings. Um, God was free to create us or not. And it, that belief has consequences. 
Well, that's being contingent. I mean, that's a that's a standard component of classical theism, of course. But uh, people don't usually draw the conclusions you draw. Well, I mean, if, if we're contingent beings, and at the same time, we want to say that divine simplicity is true, then God in a single timeless eternal instant uh, has known us as existing necessary beings that had to obtain. He was not free to create or not create us. We had to obtain because the knowledge of God is equal to God. It is God. So while some classical theists may object, many classical theists just fall on that sword and, and, uh, affirm right. yeah, it, it, it entails a modal collapse of necessarianism the the books on it um james doesel wrote the book uh on the simplicity of god and that all that's in god talking about the classical aquinas augustinian view of simplicity and even he admits that there there's some sort of mystery that goes along with how can a being of pure actuality create a world of contingency there there's there's a disconnect there and so that's what we were talking about before the show started tim stratton was pointing that out in a world of determinism that we ourselves are necessary beings necessary beings so you're saying if i'm a calvinist then i'm um, essentially the logical entailment is that god depends on me yes that um there there's there's no potentiality in god and so God having knowledge of all creation makes creation and everything that exists co-necessary with God. How does a God of pure actuality, pure act, no potentiality, create creatures of potentiality? Wait, you're, you're saying how can God who, I don't see, I guess I don't see the disconnect. So yeah, all so that is in God is God. General, so God's knowledge. Okay, go ahead. So God's knowledge is a necessary knowledge, right? All that is in God is God. The classic formation. God's knowledge is equal to himself. All that is in God is God. And God's knowledge entails the creation that he made, which is us. And so we also by extension are necessary beings there wasn't actually a potential to create anything other than what currently exists the current world system that we exist in in calvinism with a god of pure actuality yeah so no one most people don't believe that's a problem you know, they don't know about the problem well, I mean, so when you read like systematic theologies, you know, not every single one deals with this, but some do. And Christian philosophers who have a classic view of God talk about some of this stuff. It's it's not like no one knows, but they don't they don't see it as a problem. I mean, because God still God still sees well, having a discussion about it doesn't mean they see it as a problem and they definitely don't see it, generally speaking, open theism as the answer. Well, of course they don't. Uh, they appeal to mystery is their solution because it's uh, they, they can't bridge that problem. How a God of pure necessity, pure actuality has potential in his knowledge. Well, I mean, the Bible talks about according to the purpose of his will. So when we talk about scriptural phrases, I mean. Uh, right, right. Well, God the is, biblical God authors is free, didn't God is, God is pure free actuality. To act or not to act. Huh? The What'd biblical authors didn't accept a God of pure actuality. These are well, Greek <laughs> philosophical constructs that were made centuries after the Bible's written. I mean, but you're the one talking primarily in philosophical terms, but then criticizing people who are the classical theism. They're, they're your terms. It's your system. <laughs> that's not the that's not the case necessarily. <laughs> it's okay. You're you're the primary so do you disagree with philosophical. Level? primary approach you have is is philosophical so right do you do you agree with the open biblical, theist? no i don't agree with open theist but first we take the the biblical data and then extrapolate out from there it feels like with open theism it almost mm, starts with philosophical speculation before it gets to the biblical data in any serious way because it's like well if this is the case is this case well what about foundational scriptures you know that's where the real discussion it is would be i right. mean so you have to you have to feel the weight of your position chris there's a reason why it's a minority position there's a reason why it's a late development there's a reason there's a reason why for all that stuff but 
I never understood the sort of um, hubris, like, you've got to accept this. This is the only way, you know, but it's like, don't you feel the weight of your own position? The weight of my own position? It, it's the biblical position. If you take the Bible to solve Bible foreknowledge, yep. immutability, pure actuality, the it's God not. knows everything. That's what the God knows everything, and and, and we we believe God knows God everything. Works. We believe God no, knows but everything. You don't, but you, but you certainly don't. How? See, that's why, that's why I You're, don't like you know, the, some of these discussions okay. are frustrating because you guys so know the Bible, that you guys know that nobody is uh, thinking when they say God knows everything in the way you guys are. I just said God, God doesn't have to create. He doesn't have to create. Okay, right, and that's 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 my position. So there was a moment in the that's life a, but, but of brother, God. That's everyone's position, right? No, who it's not, not the classical theist position, sir. Show me who. Okay, show me James the, Wesel. Well, show me a show me who says God had to create, because you're certainly going to find a Calvinist is going to say it because they recognize it's out of God's divine nature of sharing. He has an option. The, it, it does the, not the have to create. The, no one, the, the I, I don't, I, honestly, I've never heard a discussion in which anyone said God had to create. The only people I hear say that are like along the lines of the youth pastors. You know, God was so lonely, Jesus had to die on the cross because he needed a friend. I don't hear anyone say God has to create. Okay, so if, if okay, we're, we're not arguing God had to create. We're saying if there was a moment in the life of God where he was free to create or not create, that entails an open point in the life of God, whether you want to call it a logical moment or a temporal moment, there was a moment in the life of God where the future was indeterminate, whether he would create or not. It wasn't necessary. But people like Bill Valicella, who wrote the Stanford Encyclopedia for Divine Simplicity, have noted it entails a, a modal collapse. It entails necessarianism. I've, I've interviewed uh, Ryan, Ryan Mullins on, and uh, he spoke of Catherine Rogers, a, another well-known classical theist who said, you know, well, it certainly looks like it entails that. I don't like that. I don't want to call it that. Let's not go there. But yeah, it does look that way. So, you know, this isn't this hey is some position we're not familiar with or, or that the classical theists aren't aware of. It's just something that they try to sweep under the rug rather than address. And it's it's for obvious reasons, oh, because it makes no, God no, a faded agent that. himself. It's, it's not that. It's that we... Honestly, when we hear about this, we feel like it's someone just dragging us back to the Greek gods. It's someone just dragging us away from the Bible. It's not fear. It's barely interesting because most of the people I find that are in this, it's sort of that's what they that's kind of what they do is trying to convert Christians into open theism. So it's it's hard it's hard to to say, you know, that's something I'm gonna I'm gonna look into and get behind. And that's something I'm gonna really spend time interacting with now there are people who do but it's it's not fear open theism is not attractive to me it's not interesting i don't know why some people make that the only point that they one of the main points they talk about i don't i it's not it's not fear it's another stuff you're saying you know you guys impugn a lot of motives but to us we're just like we got away from all that we got away from paganism with these gods that don't know that are kind of like humans we got away from all that. So why do we want to be dragged back into that? It's, that? it's for me, that's that's kind of my reaction when I hear it. And then when I hear the discussion, it's this philosopher, this logical entailment. That's a nice. It's interesting. So you brought that up. So this this whole question and answer you started, you didn't start with the Bible. No, no, because when I when I well, the first question I asked was pastorally. That that's the first question. Right. I yeah, it wasn't like, you didn't start the Bible. When I first came on, that's what I asked about first. And I that's, noted that's, that my chief concern was what the Bible says. Chris noted his chief concern was what the Bible said. And we started noting that there was a disconnect between what the Bible says and the claims and entailments of classical theism. And we've noted that this is even affirmed by adherents and teachers, proponents of classical theism. And yet we're the ones that are being called on the carpet for a, philo phil a philosophical approach when we're saying, that's y'all's bag. We're over here with the scripture. But we can point out the philosophical problems of your position and, and try and redirect you back to the text. Because the scripture is not your friend here. You have to dismiss it. You cannot affirm God's self-revelation in scripture without dismissing it. And I'm not saying you're doing it intentionally. 
most people are inconsistent in the way that we go about applying our doctrine. This is universal. I'm inconsistent in areas. Chris is inconsistent in areas. Marlon, we all have that. I'm trying to be kind and ecumenical here. But the general gist of it is, we'll read, like, look, look, okay, <clears throat> Genesis twenty two fourteen. Let's go to scripture. We see God described as Yehovah Ra'ah, the Lord who sees, who observes, who considers, inspects, and discerns. It's an affirmation of active awareness in the present. Classical theism denies that. He's eternally known it. There is, none of this actually has any meaning. Um, static omniscience, closed theists have to dismiss this as analogical, metaphorical, anthropomorphic, lacking any, any real meaning. So you go, well, God has always known. He doesn't weigh. He doesn't consider. He doesn't inspect. He doesn't judge and measure. He's the one who brought all this to pass. First Samuel 2, 3, God is called Jehovah Eldea, meaning a God of knowledge. It says, by him actions are weighed, weighed coming from the Hebrew word meaning to ponder, consider, and measure. And it speaks of God's active knowledge, his wisdom, his reasoning, his discernment, his intelligence, and brilliance. And while we can affirm this, the classical theist and closed theist says all of this is just an outpouring of the eternally static God. He's not weighing, considering, uh, pondering, measuring. He's not doing any of this. This is absolutely uh, no, gibberish in, in keeping with classical theism. But no one says this is, I mean, the, the words you used would not be the words that we would say when we look at those verses. Do you think God sees things? But I would say, so the, for example, the Samuel yes. one, I would say this is describing the wisdom of God. I wouldn't say anything about a static God and all this stuff. You guys, again, no one is describing these positions in this way a lot of times. Okay, as so as real quick, do you okay. ask for a quote of someone saying this? Here's James Dwezel. Yeah, this is the book, uh, God Without Parts, Divine Simplicity. He says, there has never been a temporal or logical moment, in quotes, in the divine life in which God stood volitionally over volition open to other possible worlds. The actual world is conditionally necessary and every other possible world is conditionally impossible by virtue of the fact that right. God has eternally willed just this particular world. James Wessel so saying it's, it's it. not absolutely necessary. With, how, how well, okay. it? Um, Initially so necessary. It's not, it's not so, it is condi no, notice his phrase how, conditionally yes, necessary. Notice so his phrase. So explain to me how to his prior decree a God of pure necessity can create uh, even a conditionally necessary as if that those are a meaningful phrase. They have meaning in the English language. Let's just pretend that. How can a God of pure actuality, pure necessity create this world of potentiality? Wait, wait. Let, 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 that's, that, that's a good question, but that's a loaded question. So why doesn't the phrase conditionally necessary have not have meaning? Do, do you want because me to explain what that? Because what uh, necessary. I mean, we know what necessary means, but we understand that when we use no, that word I in language, tell me. there has to be a referent, ne right? Necessary be because of what? And so when we say that, when Dolezal says that there's a sense in which this actual world is necessary, he's saying it's necessary in reference to the fact that God already has decreed that these things would, would come when, about. When did the static there, or temporal God decree anything, Merrick? He never did. The decree is God. It is eternal. Yeah, it never is, it's, 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 yeah, I think that's an equivocation. So, so going back to what you guys said earlier regarding like absolute divine simplicity, I think you guys equivocated um, between God's knowledge as his attribute, as an attribute, and like the content of God's knowledge. And so, you, th those two things, I think there's a very real sense in which those are are different, right? I could no, not not in divine simplicity. All that is in God is God. So there can't be parts. There can't be propositional statements within God's knowledge set. He has to have an eternal, simple knowledge that's unchanging and partless and identical to His essence. This is classical. Yes, theology. but this in, is an attribute. You know, in classical, you know, absolute divine simplicity. You know, Thomas would say like an attribute is an, is a relation, right? And so that relation can change extrinsically in terms of like the the external operation of god's essence as he creates but that doesn't speak to like the the internal attribute of his knowledge in general which is him in a sense in what people would say who believe in divine simplicity i wanted to i wanted to make sure i wasn't cutting which, you off there that, that that's pretty um, technical and i don't really want to discuss no, no, that no, like, i, I appreciate i, I appreciate you bringing like that up but you, you, said, stuff, but... You, you said you said relation you said relation and an atemporal classical God 
is not related. He can't even undergo Cambridge changes. So when you when you talk about relation and a Cambridge change is like, watch this. Wait, okay, just for the audience, you guys probably know, but for the audience, I am more an appeal to relational uh, as a means of of escape because the classical theist claims say that he can't have those relations. Yeah, yeah I don't right. think, that, I don't think God, that's accurate. Right? If God Go participated ahead. in any property, that property would have to precede him and exist independent of him in some sense. But then God would have no control, no sovereignty over that property. By identifying God with each of his properties and with his existence, the divine the uh, simplicity effectually precludes God's participation in any property, Doezel, in his book on divine simplicity. This is just the classical position. This is your metaphysics, not our metaphysics. Yeah, so I, I would say that, you know, if you, you take creator, when God became creator, in a sense, it wasn't a change in him. It was a change in the external relation, like nothing new happened to him. It, you know, right. he, if he, he eternally had the efficacious will of creating a world in time and the change is only in the creature that which he created and a new relation took place within, right. him, but, but not within him. Welcome to open theism. If there's any change in relationship between God and anything exterior to God that denies divine determinant or the divine simplicity you're now an open theist you added potentiality i mean, I, I, ju I just read the most famous calvinistic systematic theology of all time that i was just quoting francis turretin and you're saying welcome to open theism so maybe yeah. you don't understand our system as much as if i'm if i'm, I'm quoting I'm francis, you're saying quoting welcome Duel. to open theism yeah I I, I take, know like like I get though I get your quotes from Dole's. I've read that book, but like I'm not. You can't I'm have not relations. In it, you know, you, like the 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 classical theist conception of God cannot have before and after relations. We're not talking about an essential change. We're talking about a non-essential change, or what's called accidental properties. The classical theist God can't go from not being creator of Merrick to creator of Merrick. You are necessary in the classical conception. If, if, if God creates Merrick, that that is this and creator of Merrick. That's a change in Merrick, not a change in God. It's a change because God existed eternally apart from Merrick and now exists with Merrick, unless you say that Merrick is, according to divine simplicity, part of God. It, it's it's his knowledge. It's an, it's all of his no, actions no, 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 and no. knowledge. That, that's God. that's the content of his knowledge, not his knowledge as an attribute. He can't have a relationship with you where he didn't prior because that's a change in God. And now you're denying temporality. You're, you're right. denying that God is I, mean, I, think, I think we just have to disagree. I, to it's, not a, it's not a change in God. Uh, it's a change in, in the creature. It's the right. same way with wrath, right? If God pours out wrath on, on a creature, he, you know, that's a change in the creature, not, you know, changing Unless the will God is, is eternally pouring out wrath. Different to that's a change in God. Else. Unless God if actually God had a wrath. Point, no, no. His agency is not being changed. It doesn't become different from what it was before. The, the differences are not in the agency itself, but again, only relatively in its relation and proper order towards another thing. That's an extrinsic relationship to not a change within. The, the autemporal God, the classical conception, cannot have extrins extrinsic relationships of before and after. That, that that's completely diametric. What do you, you can't what do you, have sequential operations. You can't have before and after. Because he's what do you mean, what do you mean by by do you mean like temporally? I mean, mean you can't have I mean, those God are categories existing. you used earlier. Which, by the you way, I think it's God. ironic for you to bring up what a secular person would think of reading the scriptures and not coming away with our language, and then you use language of whether it's counterfactual. Yeah. Or libertarian free will or modal yeah, who, logic who, who's or all using these other secular things. Secular language. I'm quoting. I'm quoting people you're claiming are Christian. If you want to call them secular, go for it. No, I, I'm I, saying I, I you, er, earlier you gentlemen had made the the standard of okay. if we brought the text of the scriptures to unbelievers, what would they come away with? And what I'm saying is they wouldn't come away with the language that either side of us are using because we're both arguing we're from. We're talking about your system. I'm not talking about my system. Develop. I don't What's use. My metaphysics don't use language such as uh, necessity and uh, atemporal and pure actuality. I reject all those categories. Yeah. None of those categories are biblical. Uh, they are Platonistic metaphysics. They are not even rational. I wholly reject them. But they're, they're your metaphysics. 
which it's is okay. Important Plato for this met with Jeremiah in Jerusalem, so no, just kidding. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, you, sure you you use that language all the time. You could say this just to reduce our system to absurdity. Um, but earlier, Warren, you were using the phrase "accidental" in a very Aristotelian sense. Like it, it's abundantly obvious that we both use language in this sense, and so I don't think it's helpful either way to to make, make that critique substance, not the the nomenclature. Okay, so what's the mechanism in the Bible by which God has knowledge? What verse um, describes how he acquires it? How, how he acquires it? Yeah, w when the Bible describes how God has his knowledge, what are some of the mechanisms it describes? Yeah, um, so the, the scripture teaches that God searches things out. I don't have an issue with that. The scripture, you know, the scripture teaches, it says the darkness is not dark to him. It says he's the creator. It says the spirit's hovering over the face of the water. It says he you know, decrees all things, you know, from, from the end to the beginning. It teaches that he orders things. It teaches that all things are from him. It teaches that in him is life. If so, you yeah, think when any God of the watches, things I just mentioned contradict my system, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't they, know. They do, tell though. You. When God watches, that's external knowledge being communicated to God through a medium. When God searches, that's discursive. That That's uh, examining within. Wait, wait, God's wait, wait. Mind. Discursive. Would, would a secularist come away with the phrase discursive if you were handed the Bible? No, they would see that God thinks. Okay, so there's your, God, there's, not... there's your philosophical language. See, we both do it. It's a synonym. It, we're, we're, having to, we're having to employ your philosophical construct yeah. in order to show the problem. Yeah, it's it's the word. English it's word. Word. If not philosophy. It's just an English word. Do you know what discursive means? I, I know what it means after I started reading your blogs, like like back in the day. Right. But, it's, but, it's like, okay, so, so here, like, one thought leads to another. another. And so yeah, here's God, what I wanted to question. Creating contingency plans, that's discursive. Why, can I ask a question? Here? Why, why is it that the language that we see um, when it comes to like God and knowledge, uh, why do you, why do the open theists tend to interpret that as like, yes, God is definitely gaining knowledge in these different areas. Why is it that he can't be just communicating on human level uh, anthropomorphic language? Why can't it just be that? Why? Because anthropomorphic language is a, a way of interpretation. It's a legit way of interpreting God's word. So why why can't that type of interpretive language be used? It just has to be that God is gaining knowledge or something like that. Why can't it be? Well, anthropomorphism is not a legitimate way to treat the Bible. You could There could be metaphors. There can be personification. But anthropomorph was a slur that was used in the time of Augustine to label people who believed God actually had a body and which was the common default layman view up until the third century, they rioted in the streets and tried to kill priests who tried to tell them that God is incorporeal. And that's what happened. And so those people were called the anthropomorphs. And it wasn't until modern times that we turned that into some sort of way, a mechanism to dismiss the text. So you got personification, you have metaphor, you have simile. Those idiomatic speech has to have meaning. And so if God has wings, uh, what that means is if it if it's a metaphor, then it's connecting two realms of understanding. We understand how a hen operates and and protects her children with her wing. And we're able to take that conceptual domain and overlap that on the domain of God to apply concepts from one domain to another. So idiomatic language works the same in which there is some sort of meaning that's being communicated to man for intelligibility of some sort of actual aspect about God. And so using a metaphorical language like uh, God's wings will protect us, it's not about whether God has wings or doesn't have wings. It, it's not about that. You can't say it's a metaphor, so therefore God definitely doesn't have wings. And you can't say, oh, it's, it's, he, 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 he can't have wings or he must have wings based on that. No, it's just a metaphor. It doesn't tell us about whether God has wings or not, but it gives us a conceptual overlap between two domains so that we could understand one thing in light of another. You can't just dismiss the metaphor and say the metaphor has no conceptual overlap and it's a meaningless metaphor. It has to mean something. Language communicates something of value. 
Okay, so yeah. vocab. So, vocab um, is is anthrop anthropomorphic language a usage that we can use in scripture? Excuse my voice, man. My God, my voice is really raspy well, yeah, right now. Yeah, you know, they just said <clears throat> they just said God watches is a mechanism for uh, gaining knowledge, right? And he sees. Well, how does God do that? How does so God Job's see or watch, right? Yeah, no. In, in Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel's opponents. They literally believed that God's sight was blocked by the hills. And so there's a weird scene where Ezekiel opens, God opens up a hill for him and he goes into this dark place where they're worshiping idols. And God says, these people think that I don't see them. I do see them. That was so actually the pagans the thought God had limited knowledge. No, no, no. Israel, God's people. <laughs> Yeah, that, the people if, embracing so, a false view of, of God is the ones who thought that. But I'm saying God no, doesn't no, have so, eyes. No, no, hold, hold on, hold on. No, I'm, I'm calling foul. I'm calling foul. Hold on, hold on. I'm calling foul. Hold on a second. This is their default view of God. No, and what's the counter argument? It's not your thing. They're not Calvinists. They're their actual argument. It's not your thing. They're not Calvinists. They're their their actual Chris, argument. Not, what, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about Calvinists. And what are you talking about? I'm just asking you. I'm saying. What if I'm not even a Calvinist? Like God doesn't have eyes. So like no no how, hold, how hold does, on there's something that got raised that I have see, to address. How does God see? That's what I'm saying. How does God see? There's something that got raised I have to address. Vocab said that our position is limiting the knowledge of God, but of vocab who you affirmed that all temporal not, hold on. Of course it is. But but as 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 you affirm God is all temporal, your position I, I requires. That. You want to... I don't trust any of the way you get any of the ways you guys define. I, let me this. let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Well, you okay, you have a question. Hey, you you have a question. I was asking him, so I don't have to let you finish because because I was asking you, him a you question. A you interrupted in the middle of him asking a question. So why why all of a sudden is the floor yours? You laid a charge, and I want. Did to, I not I ask him to... a question? Are you not interrupting right. the question? Hey. Let's, uh, Am let's, I allowed let's, to answer a criticism and a charge? That, you, guys, you snuck in, in there. The you, guys, question, you, guys, you jumped guys, in. You snuck you the guys, criticism in. Yeah. You guys, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. All right, Chris did ask a question. Warren, hold on one second. Chris, go ahead, ask your question. Vocab, respond, and then Warren, you can uh, address your concern there. Well, I was just going to say, God has eyes. God has several bodies within in the Bible. There's a good book on that called The Bodies of God by Mark Smith. But go ahead, Malone, you can make your point, and then let's give Warren a few yeah, minutes so he can make his that's point. That's what I was saying. So, like, you asked a question about how God gains knowledge, and, yeah. and we discussed, well, I wasn't talking, but the discussion was happening about um, God watching, God seeing. And then we moved on to discussing uh, anthropomorphic language. And I thought that was related and interesting and, and whatnot in the conversation because we're saying God sees God watches, which we don't have a problem with that language, but we don't hold that God has eyes, like physical eyeballs with a iris and a cornea and all that kind of stuff. Are you a Trinitarian? Yes, I'm a Trinitarian. Well, uh, then you so, believe God has eyes, right? Okay, number one, we're talking about Old Testament context. Yeah, so this prior to the incarnation. Number next. two, number two, number number two, when we're talking about this, we're talking about prior to the incarnation of the Old Testament in this context, we understand what we're saying, right? So God, uh, if you want to limit it because of that, God the Father, God the Spirit don't have eyeballs. So that's anthropomorphic language right there about how God intakes knowledge, right? Well, you could see all uh, video cameras see, um, robots can see. It's, it's not limited to eyes. But yeah, God has all sorts of different bodies within the Bible. People eat with God. Uh, the elders meet with God on Mount Sinai and have the the banquet. He meets with uh, he meets with Abraham as one of the three angels. He meets uh, with in the garden. God has all sorts of bodies with it with throughout the Bible. Well, hold on. But when it says God is is investigating or searching or seeing something. It's not just saying when he's down there with Abraham with the two eyes in front of him, and that's what he's doing, right? It's it's all, it's also when there's not a theophany occurring, correct? That God is still seeing, right? It's an assumption. You'll have to pull up a Bible verse so that we could uh, look at a specific example. Well, I'm saying, would you read the Bible talks about God uh, searching out or seeing or watching or something like that? So like the, the mechanism is typically given. And so when God tests the heart in the, 
the wilderness, he throws challenges at them. And so in that way, he tests the heart to see how they're going to act. But I'm saying, do you believe that God requires physical eyeballs to see and investigate the things that he's watching? And so there are scriptures that ind indicate that God is gaining third party knowledge. Like, for so example, he can see through other people's 22. eyes. No, that he's not even aware of current circumstances necessarily. So you said God is not always aware of current circumstances. Not necessarily in the Bible. Okay, so God's not aware of current circumstances. So that's not even just Sometimes. the future. That's current circumstances. Right. And so, so any, any well, change in knowledge, any gain in knowledge is open theism. And so not all open theists agree with me. Warren has dynamic omniscience in mind. He doesn't agree with me. But yeah, in those instances within the Bible where it says that God's going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if the reports which have come to him are true, it does not appear that he holds current knowledge. And and some open theists, like God's charismatic or God's presence and charismatic, uh, that there's a book along those titles. He argues that God is repelled by sin. God doesn't necessarily, God's not forced to know everything that we think God's forced to know. God's, God's not in our little box. And especially within the biblical authors, they don't assume these categories on God. Right. So how would you say, Chris, God knew or had an inkling? Maybe I'll say it that way. How did he have an inkling there was something happening in Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place? It says that reports came to him. The ancient Near East idea was that God has a council, a divine council, and the angels will come pre present in front of him. And so angels would be advocates for certain prayers. Like even Paul holds this idea in Romans 8 where he says the spirit searches us and then communicates our needs to God and advocates in front of God on our behalf for our prayers. And so this is a fairly common idea that you're going to see in things like the Gospel of Barnabas. You're going to see it in Enoch. You're going to see it in Ben Sirah, that the angels advocate before God in this divine courtroom setting. Fairly common idea. So are you saying that you believe angels or divine beings of some sort reported to God that there was something happening in Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm that saying that, that that's what the text says. Well, I mean, Genesis 19 doesn't literally say any of that. But I'm, you're saying, yeah, but I'm trying to be charitable. You're saying in other instances, you believe that's the case. So would you believe that's the case of what happened in Genesis 19 as well? That angels came to him and said, hey, there's something going on. Yeah, give me two. Yeah. So all, all the time within the Bible, you'll see the language of uh, like in the, in the start of Exodus, where Israel's cries ascend uh, to God. And that type of language is pointing to this divine courtroom situation. So like Genesis 19, 20 or 1820, I'm sorry, where it says, then the yeah. Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very great. So you're, so you're saying the outcry was the reports of the divine beings and the council. So we're let's, getting let's into one particular interpretation. Well. We're getting into one particular interpretation in which the open position is sometimes applied. It is not a universal. And what this is doing is this is an attempt to paint the open position with a broad brush to dismiss and demonize. I see what's going on and I don't appreciate it. Vocab who, said who, who, we are limiting God's knowledge. This is probably the best part of the conversation oh, we've had yet. Him and I are talking calmly back and forth about Bible verses. Okay, I've so been, there, there are I've literally variants. nothing negative about the position. Warren, why are you so sensitive? How is that me demonizing him? Chris, did you feel like I was demonizing you just now? You said Honestly. we're limiting God's knowledge and, and that's, not, that's not correct. Well, first of all, Chris just affirmed he believes that, Warren, didn't he? That is a view within, just like so your I'm view is a view So I'm not demonizing anyone, right? Warren, if I'm literally describing his position, am I? Okay. But so Chris, if I read this text... Like was, Chris, just a second ago, I'm not talking about the whole conversation. Did you feel like I was demonizing you when I was asked a question about Genesis 18? I, I, I feel like you want to poison injured? the well, but... Well, it, it relates to the eyes. It literally, because I'm trying to get to see where we agree or don't agree on the anthropomorphic language. Right. Because we're saying God has God, all sorts of bodies in the Bible. Okay, so here's what I'm saying. This outcry to God, how did it reach him? How was he aware of it? Who did the reporting? Because you said it was divine beings coming before the council. It doesn't say right. that. It just God, says an outcry God has, has reached him. Right. Yeah, and there's divine council scenes throughout the Bible. You see it in the beginning of Job. You see it in First Kings 22. This is a common 
ancient Near East motif. Okay, and so, so you Michael think Heiser has a lot language, of good books on this. I'm sorry? But do you think outcry language, where it says outcry, equals divine counsel reportings? Yeah, it says, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So God is going to verify in Sodom whether or not the reports which have come to him are in fact true. So you would say that's also equally true of not knowing that how many righteous people were in the city, like when, when it says, right, if I, I think find that was a legitimate righteous. conversation. But how was God, so you did, yeah, okay. how was he finding out at, on, in the moment how many righteous people there were? He sent angels to go take a look. So in the middle of the conversation while him and Abraham are speaking or prior? No, they, they, they've got the game plan before the testing. So the, one of the angels job was to find out how many righteous people there were. That's what they did. It says, I will go down now to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So before that, they didn't know the number, but then after that, they did know the number, right? Is that what you're saying? That's what appears from the text. And then the discussion they had would be from hey. recent information God just gained from the angel's report. Is that correct? Hey, guys, be before mm. you respond, Chris, after you respond, Chris, let's allow Warren to get into the conversation as well. Then, Merrick, I want you to respond to what Warren has to say. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm Chris. not trying to represent all open theism. I'm, there are variants, as we've discussed, any change in God means open theism is true. And uh, from our discussion so far tonight, I'm counting both of you in the open theist camp. So Warren? Yeah, no, um, uh, uh, I was trying to note, vocab said that our position limits God's knowledge. Classical theists limit God's knowledge. They affirm that he is autemporal and that he cannot know tense propositions. God does not know that we are having this discussion. He doesn't know Warren and Chris and Marlon and Vocab and Merrick are discussing this. Hold on, Warren, he doesn't can know I tell that. him real quick? Hey, yo, God, having a discussion on open theism, Marlon's channel, cool? Does he know now? In our view, he, he does well, know. He but in your view, no. he doesn't. Yeah, in our view, he does know, but in your view, he doesn't. So to say that our view limits God's knowledge is to, is to be disingenuous with your own position, which does limit God's knowledge. He doesn't know what time it is. We affirm divine cognition. I mean, like God, God actually is intelligent. He knows things. And it's not because he is eternally the source and some ethereal fate machine that's necessit necessitating all of this to be an outflowing. But the other point is biblical omniscience is defined as God being all-seeing. It's all seeing. It's not eternally decreeing and manifesting in time. It is all seeing. And so when we're talking about what is biblical omniscience, that's whenever our position wins. Whenever we get into the, having to point out the philosophical problems of your position, you'll say, well, I don't believe that. And we'll quote a scholar and you'll say, well, I disagree with him. Why are you going there? But when we go to the scripture, we see that the biblical omniscience is a dynamic omniscience. It is a living, free, relational, responsive, all-seeing omniscience. That's biblical omniscience. God knows all the facts. What the classical theist is doing is begging the question for an exhaustively settled, eternally faded future. We're saying not so. God is not faded to, to tomorrow to, to have to respond in a particular way. He is relational. He can, he can respond however he wants. He's free. The future is not faded. We're not faded. God's not faded. Now, we can reach a point in which we're handed over to judgment. We can get into all of that. But the simple fact of the matter is God is free. The future is not faded. He is all seeing. That's biblical omniscience. That's what the Bible talks about. And if you want to go into particular passages, we could look at Psalm 8, 4. What is man that you think of him and a son of man that you're concerned about him? Well, classical, the classical theism says God doesn't think about man. And he's not concerned because he's immutable, impassable, atemporal. He doesn't operate sequentially. But David is asking this question here. You'll see he notices a verb, a verb using about God thinking. That's action. That's sequence. That's temporal location, extension, duration, and location. God, we go in and we talk about um, 
uh, what is it? Jeremiah? Um, yeah, Jeremiah 31, 34. I will forgive their wrongdoing and their sin I will no longer remember. The Hebrew word translated as remember is zakir, and it means to recall to mind. It actually talks about God having sequential thoughts. But if it we're going to stick with classical theism, then our wrongdoing is eternally before God. So not only is are we going to say, well, his memory and calling that to mind as an anthropomorphism, let's, dis let's dismiss it. Now we're saying it has no meaning at all because our sin is eternally before him. We're going to have to completely rip out Jeremiah 31, 34. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to paint some broad brush of, well, Chris Fisher or Warren McGrew's definition of a particular interpretation of a particular passage is the open theist position. What we're saying is, is biblical omniscience is that God is all seeing. God is not like the classical theist described. So the incarnation, boom, disproves classical theism. The fact that God responds to prayer disproves classical theism. The God, the I mean, fact that God has relationships and is responsible Warren, making disproves classical theism. None of those things disprove it. Like this is just a lot of this is strong uh, uh, assertion yeah. and straw manning. And when no, I was let asking me, let me the position, Warren, I didn't necessarily know what he was going to say. Do you know what I mean? I didn't know those. I wasn't trying to do something. I wanted to see what he would say. Uh, and those are legitimate questions because that's a common passage in these discussions, right? Genesis 18 and 19, very common. And I thought it related since we were talking about the eyes and the seeing. You know, like when you talk about particular passages that relate to what we're currently talking about, it'd be like Ezekiel 1, right? The wheels with the eyes in all directions. That's a representation using ancient Near Eastern stock imagery that shows God's seeing everywhere. But none of that's literal, but it means something. Right. See, and I, 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 have, I have no problem. I, I have I no problem if you want to ask Chris his interpretation of the text. It shows a God what? who can see everything. Right. What What other picture should we get when we see eyes on the wheels? That's telling us he sees everything. Right. Is it, do you think you can get out of Ezekiel it, one? It's like, not God in the text, though. That's that's a creature, right? This is representational. I mean, when you look at it, um, wheels on eyes. You know, that's not something right. I'd it, want to drive around. I don't think that'd be. It's very an all-seeing angel. So when an when all-seeing uh, angel. So yeah, wait a minute. King David, say that's true. Then that means that angel would be able to see everything, correct? Well, it depends how it's being used. If it's a generality. King David is said to see all things as the, the angel of the Lord sees all things. And that's that's one of the interesting texts in the Bible. Uh, I'll pull up the reference. Hey, Merrick, don't be go ahead. Jump in there, Merrick. Um, don't yeah. Be, don't be um, hesitant, man. So I think what I'm diagnosing and I, I've I followed you guys for a while is you, you guys definitely do a big bona fide disagreements. Right. I remember, Chris, in your in your debate and I, Chris, I, I respect you seriously. Um, 40 through 48 like i remember uh, the the question was like when god counts the water and i specifically remember you were pushed on it if you would forget and your response to that was like well he would need to recount because the amount of water fluctuates right and so i i do think there is big disagreement but be between both of you that i think you need to give give more credit to but present knowledge no, no, my, my point yeah my i love that was, right, i, no I love I have no problem if you want to press myself or Chris on a particular interpretation. That's completely fair game, and we are not a monolithic position. So that's all yeah, fair. No, uh, okay, okay. My, so, my so objection the, 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 was, my, my specific objection was saying that our view uniquely limits God when that's not fair. And our, my, also, my other objection was to come in and say, let's note that there is a, a disagreement over a particular interpretation of a passage. And then we can actually go, okay, well, here's an interpretation. Here's an interpretation. But even that interpretation is what is the classical theist interpretation of that? What's the converse interpretation other than to dismiss it? It has no, it has no yeah, okay. one to so, one truth value. So a couple things. So actual present knowledge, uh, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, right? Cattle on a thousand hills, all the birds of the hills, right? All right. And so, so you have these texts in the scripture which are also equally present. And, and my issue is if if he doesn't, you know, if he's searching out the, the 50 righteous in the sense in which you suppose, like all the claims regarding God's divine justice are gone, okay? So every abortion clinic in America, is he searching out how many children are going to be killed? Like, how, how does he render justice? He says, their blood is precious in my sight. There's no way 
on on your view where he has to you know count to know that that he could have justice for all these children um so take take the issue you, so you mentioned like the covenantal language of he forgets sin and I'm, I'm just going through the things you said so so like i will remember your sin no more um far as the east is from the west that that's just standard into language god says child sacrifice never entered into his mind and yet throughout the history of israel he literally documents it in isaiah jeremiah ezekiel it's, it's and so there are me. very clearly two different things going on here and so when we speak of anthropopathos or anthropomorphism here's my issue guys and this is the question what why i joined and, and i want to ask this question is why do you speak of anthropomorph anthropomorph as if it's some special absurd absurd thing included in this term when in reality literally any revelation conceivable regarding god must be anthropomorphic in the first place by virtue of the fact that we're not God. If it was not anthropomorphic, the only other option would be silence. Like, what is the other option? So can I make a couple points in a row? Yeah, sure. I mean, that, I'm, I, I'm just curious. Like, like, what other options do, do we have besides so real, him speaking quick, in the way that classical theists say he is? Right. Second Samuel 14.20 has the reference to uh, King David having the wisdom of the angel of God to know all things that are on the earth. It appears that God does have these type of messenger beings that are endowed with some type of visual omniscience or other type of knowledge. So uh, I believe the wheels with eyes is an angelic being and opinions may differ. But you you ask about language. So all languages is Lord is wise according to the wisdom of angels of the angel of God to know Maybe all I'm, things I'm, that are on the earth. Yeah. I mean, the reference is, is wisdom. Right. Maybe There's I'm an angel the right of God translation. that knows all things on earth. And King David's knowledge is compared to that. I'm looking at it. So, so yeah, obviously yeah, the, the context is like all political things, the different stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Here in chapter so 14. obviously the phrase does, is not trying to say that uh, King David has some sort of atemporal, ungenerated, eternal, non-falsifiable, yeah, yeah, yeah. non The knowledge. context determines what it means, yeah. Right. And so this angelic being, it, it, it's, it's a hyperbole, but this angelic being has some sort of omniscience and some capacity. And I, I think that's what the reference to the wheel with eyes is, rather than a direct reference to God. Yeah, the wheel with eyes is some crazy stuff. I remember reading that Ezekiel right. for the first time. It's a really interesting. Well, well, I mean, I love that chapter. Yeah, your question was about anthropomorphic language, and so where else in what literature do we use this term, the this fit type of speech, to describe what's going on in the text? When I think about anthropomorphisms, I think about like the brave little toaster or Disney's Cars, where it's it's a framing device for fiction, uh, Puss in Boots, something like that. It doesn't communicate. I, I was homeschooled. Um, yeah. Hey, so you didn't watch Brave Little Toaster? It's a classic. <laughs> no. no, okay, it's a classic. Uh, if you got kids, show them Brave Little Toaster. But uh, it's a framing device for fiction. And so there are is personification within the Bible. Like it talks about wisdom in the Proverbs and it paints wisdom as uh, a yeah, some lady sort wisdom. of person. And the Gnostics mm -hmm. thought that was an actual person, an actual deity. It could be the case, but I think it's a personification, which is different than anthropomorphism. You got some, Yeah, I would agree. I think it's the person of the divine wisdom and the logos and Yeah, you got yeah. some personification in the mountains and like ascribing motivations to the mountains it's personification it's a different type of idiom than what people mean by anthropomorphism and so personifications are meant to illustrate some sort of truth concept there has to be conceptual overlap in the domains of speaking and so if you're saying that no language can give us conceptual domain overlap about god is basically saying that all language is useless to communicating anything of yeah, substance. I think, I, I think your 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 fallacy is to say that if God if if we believe that God is portrayed in an anthropomorphic 
perfect sense passages that we've been speaking of that then they must not contain positive truth values or teach important principles about the, the God that we serve and worship. But I don't think that's the right. case at all. Right. My, my, my take is a historical take. There's no indication that any of the biblical authors thought in these terms. And uh, we're, we're terms? trying to communicate, as, as uh, Calvin writes, a baby talk to us yeah, because I agree. we're not on that yeah, conceptual that's level. that's fine. And so it's, it's basically yeah, I don't have any issue, any issue with that. And so if you uh, agree not, with I'm me... I'm not bound to use the language of... of of Calvin here, right? I, like, right. I don't think and, the, the phrase so, homoousius, I'm not going to say, was was conceptually within the framework of the Israelites at the time of right. Jeremiah. Like, you what, and I actually might, you and I might actually exit this debate with an agreement that if the Bible is read literally, it's just teaching open theism, and then your counterclaim would be that there is some sort of system underlining this that. The authors didn't actually believe the literal words that they're writing, and they actually believed in this other special concept of God. I would be happy with you claiming this. Are you, are you familiar with the, the the conception of the regula fide or the analogy of faith? Uh, go uh, inform me. So, so, so Irenaeus talks about this, uh, like in our hermeneutics, as we understand the scriptures, we, we recognize that uh, as the scripture interprets the scripture, we allow the clearer passages, the, the doctrinally um, passages which are, are arranged in such a fashion that they have teaching authority over less clear narratives as we use the you know, conventions of language and grammar to, to discern in that sense. So, so that, 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 that's, that's something Irenaeus talks about. Is that something you're familiar yeah. with? I'm familiar with that. Yeah, so, so that's what I would say ultimately the debate falls into. I think our hermeneutic is actually perhaps maybe similar than we think it is, but we disagree one, over which texts should be lord over which texts. Well, I think Warren has a very good point that he's going to give. Warren, I saw your hand up. Yeah, so so when we talk about the analogy of the faith or that the clear you know, dictates and, and determines the unclear, in 1 Corinthians 2.11, it says, For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. You know, so we, we see the, this idea of divine ideas, uh, this doctrine of, of God's thoughts, of, of God. And, and this entails uh, sequence. It, it entails consideration. It entails wisdom. This is not something that is eternally static and just must obtain this is this is something that that god is very clear in communicating through the holy and uh, holy spirit inspired script of, of the scriptures that he is pondering that he is deliberating that he is careful that he is considering these things that he's thinking over these things um we see in no, uh, jeremiah no, no, 18 no, 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 no. we see in jeremiah 18 I... that he describes himself as a potter at his wheel working with this clay when it mars in his hands, he repurposes it. He didn't set out to make it a, a vessel of wrath, but he repurposes it. You see the responsiveness of God. All throughout Scripture, you're going to see that the Holy Spirit-inspired text, these authors, at the very least, we could say they were, they were not as enlightened as our Neoplatonist brethren, but they believed, like, like you and Chris have just established, they believed that God is relational, responsive, and not at all like the strong philosophical depictions we see in classical theism. Now, maybe the biblical authors were not as enlightened, or maybe they hadn't been educated, or maybe they were in error, but the biblical descriptions of God portray the open position. And, and so that's the okay. point that I'm trying to make. I think that's the point Chris is trying to make here. Now, we may interpret Here's the text of Scripture brother. differently. I, I what like I think you guys think that I give a lot more allegiance to to f philosophy than I really do. So you mentioned uh, you know God you know God's thoughts right. So so take Isaiah I think it's fifty five. Okay, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Okay, the whole context of that is not this se sequential knowledge that proves open theism. The context is. Isaiah 59, truth has stumbled in the public squares, right? Uh, what, what does it look like when a nation is under God's judgment? 
right? That, that text is teaching that right, the heavens are high above the earth. And so God's ways are higher than our ways. Here's the text. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. And then, and then it talks about joy and, and, and peace. And that whole context of the third section of I, Isaiah is talking talking about this land that is under judgment and contrasting the, the body of their, their beliefs, right, with the truth and peace and love that is found in, in God. Uh, like I think then Isaiah 60 goes, arise, let, let my light shine on you, this beautiful divine peace. That's what that's teaching. Like, like where do you, do you get that, that philosophical, okay, God's thoughts, therefore there's this sequential temporal process. Like, you think I get that from that? Like, why would you, why would I get that from that text? So the context of that is that God will respond to people based on their actions. If Israel yes. repents, God will change his mind, change his yes. ways and show mercy yes. unlike a man would. And so that's yes. where we get it. Yes. That God is saying he that, that he responds to outside inputs and adjusts according to changing circumstances. This is throughout the Bible. Within Jeremiah 18, it, this process is described in detail. It's giving, given in the parable of the potter. And then it's described explicitly that God says both that he won't do what he said he was going to do and won't do what he thought he was going to do based on people changing their ways. God responds in real time to people's actions and adjusts according to their behavior. This and is God accepting out that input. In, in like a bunch of those narratives, like Jeremiah 18, for example, it's like he's already predetermined that like there's already these conditions in place before they do anything in the first place. So of course, so like if he, God... if he predetermines if he's going to do X, if they do Y, of course he's going to do X if, if they do Y. Like that's what that's does thought given, to do right? mean? What he says, I won't do what I thought to do. What does thought to do mean? Uh, the, the way I interpret that narrative or, or that text is that which he would do under a certain set of like circumstances, like if the, those creatures had done those things. So like would a normal person who's reading this text think that God changed his mind? Like if you just grab someone well, the, off the street. The, I mean, the. Out? Many, many texts say that God changed his mind. Why would, why would, right. I mean, so I'm if you show them these I texts, believe the scripture. So of course, yeah. So God changes his mind. Of course. Okay. Do, do you think that's in, do you think citing the text of scripture is contradictory to the Calvinistic Protestant right. position? Okay. Because do you if believe you God do, changes his mind? <laughs> if you define it, I don't yeah, have to well, qualify course. myself. It, yeah. Now we and we disagree over what that means, but notice just citing the scripture is not going to cause me to flinch. Right, because Calvin and Philo of Alexandria and all these church fathers have a connective fit over people who think that God actually repents and changes his mind. And they have vitriolic statements. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just cite a Jew as a church father? Philo of Alexandria. No, so, what, 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 <laughs> bro, man, there's something going on Calvin's with the Jews, man. That father. guy was not a church father. Okay, Who? neither's Calvin. Okay. Hey, listen, never listen. Said he was. Yes, of course Clement not. Of of Alexandria course Calvin wasn't a church father. Of Alexandria <laughs> was highly dependent on Philo. Uh, Augustine was highly dependent on Philo. These people cite him all the time. They're highly dependent on him. They're in the same tradition. They're I all was just in reading through the confessions, and he kind of dunks on Philo a little bit, but yeah. Clement, Origen, Augustine, they're all which in Clement, which Clement? tradition. Of Alexandria, not Clement of Rome. Clement of the Rome yeah. is an open theist. But that's what I mean. Like, Ooh, I, guess, I don't know about that. Remember when I originally asked a question about uh, like God changing his mind or when I was speaking about like anthropomorphic language and vocab, I want you to chime in on this as well and then interact with Warren as well because you guys have been pretty quiet. Um, what uh, the, the, I guess what I think it is is like all right if this is if, if we see in scripture that God says that God changes mind or it's it's it, impl it appears that God changes mind, but we see another scripture where it shows that God has all has knowledge He has all knowledge and He sees all things. Like and I think this is what Merrick was talking about. Like we take the the scripture that are more explicit and we use those to sort of interpret the, the the vague verses the verses that show a little vagueness that are not as clear and so i think that's what merrick was pointing to so i think 
like this is what the like the, the determinist or you know the compatibilist position is concerned about is that like all right well if we look at scripture and we see we see that the scripture is explaining God in this way and we see the scripture explaining this God in this way while we swing it so far left to say well it must mean that God doesn't know all things you know what I mean or he knows the possibilities of all things but he definitely doesn't know all things like why well, such a Bible hard swing believers, believers know all things right in the Bible believers know all things what do you mean by that what do you mean what do you mean believers uh, know all things? What do you mean? First John 2 20, it says that we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit and we know all things. And so it, it's this no, common no, language. It, but I mean, the same epistles say we, that we, our prayer, the prayer is for us to grow in knowledge, grow in knowledge and wisdom. Right. And so you take a phrase yeah, and it's used about people you. Yeah. and you take it one way. But when it's the, used the about God, it's about doing your theology. It, it's special pleading. Yeah, no, because there's a bunch of phrases and descriptions and characteristics that are given of God that would never be given of any human, you know? Well, that or, doesn't you know. seem to be much true in my experience. So uh, it what? says that people understand all things in Proverbs 28, 5, that people are filled with all knowledge, Rome, Romans uh, 15, 14. They know things perfectly from the beginning, Luke 1, 3. King David knows all things on the earth. We already talked about that. The writer of Ecclesiastes have seen all the works under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.14. No secret can be hidden from the Prince of Tyre. Okay. Ezekiel 28, that's the case, 3. Chris, why does Paul, just, you're, you're citing Paul in some of these. Why does he pray that the believers he writes to would grow in knowledge? Because he doesn't, when, when they use these phrases, it doesn't mean classical conceptions of omniscience. T typically it's generalities. If my wife says, oh, Chris, you know everything, you know, I'm helping her with her math homework, you know, things like that, you know everything. It's just a general phrase that means I know a lot of things. I know generalities. I, I have a good grasp of all sorts of different domains. It's, it's not a metaphysical statement. And so a big mistake that people have when coming to the Bible is they think, they think all these little phrases that they pull out of a context are metaphysical claims about God, which just normal language. And when it's used about normal people, they will read it as if it's normal language. But when they read it about God, they really think it's deeply about their own specific theology. But it's a weird form of special pleading. But Chris, that's definitely not right. For example, Daniel 435, he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou no one talks about humans that way under any circumstance at least they shouldn't chris ephesians 1 11 the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will psalm 119 so I, your word is settled in heaven right I mean, and um, you're, you're you're saying people read the scriptures pull out a context and the authors are just saying god you know a lot of stuff just like chris with his wife when he helps right. her homework but the bible's saying much more than that chris I got a reading comprehension question for you. And so if we turn to wait, the wait, wait. Would you feel comfortable describe, saying any of these things I just read, would you feel comfortable ascribing them to a human being? I'm saying that those phrases are not imbued with the metaphysical properties that you're claiming. Yeah. Would God you feel can... comfortable ascribing any of these phrases such as, would you feel comfortable saying this? Chris, your hand is stretched out. Who shall turn it back? Should I say that about you? Yeah, that language can be used about kings all the time, like normal people. So, Chris, could I say it about you? Yeah, you could. If if I'm powerful and I so get you would take done, praise that only God deserves, listen, Chris. Your 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 this indignation is, is not an argument. It ends up in idolatry. Almost. Read, reading comprehension question for you. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in an idolatry question. No, I'm more get, interested in that. reading comprehension. Look at, look at this. I no. could say this to you. Your counsel will stand, Chris, and you can do all you please. If you spoke, Chris, you're Chris going to bring it to pass. Was unjust. Could I say that about you, Chris? Music. So the reading comprehension question. What? This phrasing is used in the new Malish to describe Timot. It says her decrees are firm. They are beyond resisting. What does it mean? If you came across that phrase in a new Malish, what do you think it means? Do you think it means 
Calvinistic control, determinism, all things are faded. Is that your conception if you read that phrase? When you, when you read that phrase like a normal human being, what does it mean to you? And then We're not arguing for the, the no, I'm phrases asking you, that you're Calvin reading I don't think. I'm Wait, asking you to use your reading comprehension to understand a very similar phrase to what you're talking about to see if there's if a normal person when they come across that phrase has any of your implications that no, you're claiming your I don't fake moral think, outrage about whatever no, idolatry it's not, it's let's not see if Christ, it holds it's when, it, when it's tested with a normal, not fake. A normal yet, text can i answer i don't think that the babylonian god who's the personification of salt water knows all things it's a, it's a re, it's a reading comprehension question. No, he was asking me if the a Babylonian what does god it mean? Of salt water knows all things, and the answer no. is no. No, I'm I'm asking you, what do you think the author is trying to communicate to the audience she, in that you sentence? Know, she, you know, she was destroyed by what Marduk, is the right? author trying to communicate to the audience <laughs> so when this, they write that? Is, that narrative already contains data about Tiamat, which causes us to interpret it differently. There's already yeah. contextual things. Okay, that okay. Cause, you that. can't just take the proposition. Yet. And look at that proposition and say that there's only one way. So the phrase it. is not inherently Input. imbued with your metaphysics. Notice, Chris, Chris, just, just notice what you're doing. You're literally the going phrase to phrase is not God. inherently imbued with your metaphysics. You're say literally it. going to pagan gods to tell us how to interpret no, the God I'm of the No, I'm reading Bible. comprehension. I'm testing no, if you can not. read. You're, I'm testing if you know the, how to read. Reading the old Chris, I'm testing if you know pagan. how to interpret language that's laid in front of you in a sentence structure. The ontological nature of Tiamat and Marduk is radically different, described even when in the context. When you're interpreting these a phrase, have, it's based on These gods context. have origin stories, for example. They can't it's know not, all things. They can't be uh, a say. They can't be having everything be dependent upon them because they themselves didn't know what exist. John Roswell has then? a great book on this called The Bible Among what, the Myths. So, Chris, what does the phrase you're trying mean? to drag our hermeneutic Good along book. into reading the Bible through pagan lenses. It's not a no. I'm asking you a reading comprehension question. That's not Forget what you're the Bible doing because it's talking the about phrase mean. Well, Chris, we're showing this, you. We're this, showing you the. It's not about the Bible. It's reading comprehension. Can Chris, you read? What does the phrase mean? The phrase th that's the point. The phrase means different things in different contexts, and pagans, regardless of what lavish play praise they give to their false gods. It doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it relevant. And they definitely don't mean it the same way that a the faithful phrase, Hebrew does. You can see this with the case yeah. of Baal, with Baal worship. You can see this in many cases. So we're not taking it out. We're not just taking it merely as so literature. We understand this metaphorical and an ontological your, context that we're also proof discussing. Your texts These don't God mean what you claim. Birthday, Chris. Our God you haven't have birthday. provided evidence. There's no evidence that your proof texts mean what you claim. You just admitted the same language. No. In a yes, different Chris. context, means something okay. else. In the in the Babylonian in the Babylonian creation myth, is Tiamat not destroyed by Marduk? It is. That's the thing. Okay. The phrase so is that, not. The so phrase is not. We know it's material. This God's not eternal. The phrase doesn't this mean God what you claim. This is not all powerful. This God, if she knew all right. things. Why didn't she know she was about to get ripped in half by Marduk? So the phrase doesn't mean your claims. You need to in show from Bible, context. To the one true you need by virtue of the, the Bible, fact of the context, you need to different. look at your proof text and you need to show from context that those proof texts Chris, mean what you claim. Should we read the Bible according what to we do. pagan worldview? Yeah, or we should read worldview? it like a normal person with normal reading comprehension techniques. We should read the Bible. Okay, so do you agree that the context of literature is relevant, Chris? The con yeah. Okay, that's all we're yeah. agreeing on. Now, back to this. No, could I say no. to you that Your you can do whatever you please, and if you've spoken, you, you'll bring it to pass? Can I say that to you accurately? Yeah, God like says Isaiah that about people. God says that about people. God tells people that they can do whatever they purpose. Yeah, that, if, if, okay, I, if I I show the text, will you apologize? I'm going to read this to you. Text, Isaiah 46, 10 through 11. Declaring the end from the beginning. No, nope, you're changing the question. from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Yes, I have spoken. Okay. I will also bring it to pass. I have purpose. I will you ready? Speak. You're saying God tells people will they can do that same thing. He says that nothing that people want to do can be withheld from them. 
that people could do anything that they want to do. They have the power to do anything. That's what God tells people. Will okay, so apologize? did Nebuchadnezzar? Okay, okay, okay. Did Nebuchadnezzar want to crawl around and eat like an animal? No. The point is, the phrase doesn't mean your metaphysics that you're importing to the text. <laughs> okay, so you're saying so does God, God tell people they God's nothing prophet. that they want can be denied for them? So you're saying that God's prophets? No. You God's need to listen to what I actually the say. The same way about him as they do other human beings. You're saying, I'm saying it's all God the same. Says, we shouldn't take into account their ontology or anything like that. It, God could equally have the same kind of phrases that his creatures can have. That's what you're saying. I'm telling you that God says that nothing that man wants to do is impossible for them. Then why do. does Jesus say there's things that are impossible with man, impossible with God? Because this is such an atomized what you're reading doing. you have to come to because to try to, phrase to, try to hold on to your position. Claim. I can't no, hear you frame, speaking. The phrase, Chris, it's if not you're talking about talking, I can't hear you saying. Your theology. I can't respond to what you're sure. saying because every time I'm speaking, you're speaking underneath. So I don't know actually know what you're saying right now. No, you you say you say that I claim something and I'm not claiming that thing. Every single time you told, uh, said okay. something that I supposedly claim, I didn't claim. How about this, Chris? Is there any unique praise or adoration that only God would deserve that humans could not receive? Is there a category well, not, of speech? I'm not familiar with the term almighty being applied to man anywhere in the Bible. I, don't, I didn't ask you that question. I'm asking you this. Is there any category of speech, any type of, of ascription, any... Any adoration that would be reserved for God alone that a hu you could not speak of regarding probably a not in human language. It, there's it's probably not a thing in human language. That's how but human language how works. Chris, do you human, see why no, your moral outrage is not an argument? You're saying you're you're saying moral outrage, Chris. Argument. All right. Do you All see? Right. I just want you to understand okay. why there is a fear of your position, but it's a fear that it ends right. up in idolatry. That's so let's the read this verse. We don't want to be dragged into idolatry, Chris. And I'm, right. that's yeah, not your moral outrage. I'm genuinely concerned argument. about idolatry here. I'll, I'll make sure that the okay. other guys can you, talk, you, but it's a you real have concern. To understand. Moral outrage. I'm going to mute myself. I'll, so you I'll, guys can I'll talk. read the verse real quick, and then I'll let Warren give some input. It says, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Genesis eleven six. Warren. Yeah, in in Isaiah, <clears throat> I want to make sure I was unmuted. In Isaiah, the uh, the test of the unknown gods, or the test of the false gods, excuse me. Um, he gives a standard, and he says, "Look, they can't walk. I can get up and I can walk. I can do these things. Look, they can't do this. I can do these things. Look, they can't do this. I can do these things." In our in our view. God can do things. This is one of the enact, the uh, initials of dynamic omniscience. That's D-O. He can do things. And in the static view, he is eternally, uh, temporally locked in a single timeless static instance of pure actuality. He can't go from doing this to doing that. He has to do all things eternally, single, in a timeless act. He can't think. He can't have thoughts. There is just thought, pure non-sequential, atemporal thought. And so if you actually go by the test of the false gods and you look at Isaiah, that is going to affirm dynamic omniscience and it's going to refute classical theism. I see we've got Matt on the, uh, the program. Matt, I've got a video link to you, sir, where you actually came in and affirmed dynamic omniscience and related it to the Trinity. So this will be a very interesting conversation because you defended the thoughts of God and that God is a thinking person. And so I really appreciated that. And so I'll be interested to see if you have any pushback here for vocab. But um, I think Mar uh, Merrick had something he wanted to say, too. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, vocab, I'm with you, brother. Um, we have to understand, like, Chris believes that God acted unjustly towards Job. Like, Chris has spoken extremely highly of, like, Moses' own intellect in contrast with, with God's wisdom like like his his theology has compacted on him in such a powerful way that that these things slip out and 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 the contradiction is on the one hand he's trying to affirm i'm just trying to be real old testament 
But on the other hand, he's treating the Hebrew Old Testament as if it's like a state code of statutes that's just propositions. He's like, I interpret this, this, you know, whether it's the Enuma Elisha or, or whatever, just in terms of the propositions. And like, if I were to place the scriptures in a room with only, you know, secularists that, that didn't know the scriptures, what would they come, what interpretation would they come with? That was the example you gave, Chris. That's what someone says about the scriptures that doesn't want to read them in context that like when, when we tried to tell you the the context of of tiamat okay that the the narrative already had shown that tiamat was a finite material being you skirted that to the side even though that's quite literally the most important data to that narrative so this, and so just this is notice, weird... notice these contradictions brother it's a weird character assassination. It's not true at all that I elevate Moses above God. God changing his standards for Moses is not something that I endorse. I'm a very vindictive guy, and so I'm fine with collateral damage. And so me, your little weird praises that I think Moses is smarter than God or something like that's that's weird. If if Moses presents arguments in Exodus 32 and God considers them, doesn't make Moses smarter than God. God often changes his plans based on the petitions of people to do things that God himself doesn't want to do. And sometimes you're just God's reading from your website, Chris. Emotion. You're just I'm reading sorry? from your website. I'm I I, I don't I'm, have my I'm website. I'm trying to speak to your heart here, here, dude. The, I, no, this, I, that's like yeah, verbatim yeah. from your, your response to like... Re remember like, I, when I know we started here and I said, I'm a weird biblical autist. I don't care about your emotions. It just... No, I, I, it, I, 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 I understand that. I'm not talking about emotions. I'm talking about the fact that you cannot separate the mind when you're doing biblical theology. And your theology is not satisfying right. to the heart or the mind, but it does right. have implications for both. If you want a special plea, right. uh, go right ahead. I, I do think that we agree from what you're saying that the Bible reads like an open theist wrote it. And this 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 whole little thing that you have to go through to try to dismiss the text, um, it's pretty evident that you're insecure with the face value of the biblical text. What's up, Notice Matt? What's, what going what What's going on with you? What's going on, I'll let Matt get in here. God bless you guys. Hey, Matt, you... Matt, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I think, Warren, you said yeah. that you wanted Matt to address the idea of God having thoughts. I think that's what you were saying. Yeah. I've, um, so, um, um, Matt, do you recall uh, yourself saying that, that God has thoughts? And uh, how do you address that as far as the, the, the conversation of open theism? I don't recall uh, what context I said it. Uh, people often take me out of context. Nothing is happening here. So I can't recall the context, so I can't really comment about it. Yeah. Uh, or in, in, a, in a video, you, you were defending in a video, you were defending the Trinity and talking about the interpersonal relationship between father and son and divine thoughts and sequence. And, uh, and you were essentially articulating dynamic omniscience. I had several people reach out to me and say, hey, did you just see Matt into your view? And so I did a video, I'll, I'll tweet it out later, or put it on Facebook, just, it's an older one so people can find it. But uh, I was appreciative of, of, of the affirmation of divine thought and sequential operations within the Trinity. That was, that was beautiful. Well, I'm not sure what you're getting at. Uh... Uh, like I said, I don't rem recall the context, so I'm not sure what you're saying. What you're trying to get me to say? Oh, what, what, what I'm what I'm trying what I'm trying to say is is that in in a very simplistic dynamic omniscient model, not um, um, you know, like God, God doesn't know the future. No, you know that you were going to take a sip of that water at some point today. Um, I'm just saying, in a very simplistic uh, divine cognition sequential operations within the interrelation of the Trinity and divine thoughts and sequence. Um, that was, it was very refreshing because you use that to defend the beauty and the reality of the, of the Trinity. And so you actually had appealed whether you may not know the terms or the entailments. And so I'll grant all that um, of my position, obviously, but, but you were appealing to whether you'd realize it or not to a very simplistic, like mere dynamic omniscient position, to defend the validity of the Trinity. So I saw that as having tremendous apologetic uh, 
value that uh, that you were able to use it in that way. And I, I, I know you and I have locked horns in debate before, but I found myself saying amen and amen and was grateful for it. I still have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Hey, so I think one of the one of the, the things that are one of the things that greatly concerned me uh, as it concerns open theism is the idea of the elect God knowing those who He's going to save. Um, um, uh, as it concerns redemption, uh, do you see? Uh, let me ask Matt this, Matt. Do you see? a problem with open theism and the idea of redemption and God's elect of, of how do you see that there's an issue of between course. the two? All right. Can you go ahead and explain to that? And then Warren, you can sort of respond yeah, well, to Matt. Well, but before we answer that, I'd like to ask a couple of questions, the foundation of, of knowledge, what they affirm. I don't even know who the open theists are here. I was just driving the whole time and then just got home. So I want to know what things, and from the open theist perspective, I want to know what things God does not know. I, I'll tell you my, my, my model, and then uh, uh, Chris can give you his, his summary. I hold to something called dynamic omniscience. That is that God is omniscient. He knows all the facts. It's based in a presentist ontology or a dynamic theory of time. And because there are tensed facts, God knows them, and tensed facts change their truth value. So he knew you were driving and intended to come on, and he knows you're now on, and when they're over, he'll know you're no, no longer on here because he knows reality as it is tensely. And then uh, point three is there's some moment in the life of God where the future was open, and he was free to create or not create. He wasn't fated to create. He freely chose to create. And so uh, at some point in the life of there is where future contingent positions are not eternally settled. You, you can take that to a broader con context and say even after creation, future, not all future con, or future contingent propositions are eternally settled, or you can hold to like a, almost like a Molinist position of middle knowledge, but a mere dynamic omniscience is God was free to create or not. He wasn't compelled. He knows tense propositions and he knows all things. And so that's, that's kind of my view. I don't see the future as necessary or eternally static. So that, that's my, uh, Chris has a, a particular metaphysical model as well. Yeah, so the Bible um, gives us the mechanism. So what, what, but uh, uh, let's, let's allow I'm Matt. So let's allow Matt I don't to, know what you're saying. Yeah, let's allow Matt to interact with Warren for a little bit. Hold on, Chris. <clears throat> so, what is it God doesn't know? I got my fingers on my keyboard. You, I asked you what he does not know, and you said he knows all facts. Dealing with present tense, God freely chooses to create. But I asked. What does he not know? Oh, uh, that's just real simple. God doesn't know untruth as true. So, so God doesn't know that um, I won't do this tomorrow as I will do this tomorrow. He doesn't know I may do this as I must do this. And this is an early church view. It's just he doesn't know untruth as true. Untru What's untruth? I, I'm having to ask for clarifications all over the place. What, yes, what's sir. an untruth besides a leftist talking point? Oh, well, that would be a quote from an early church father. I don't think he was a leftist. I can, I don't I can care pull about up church the fathers. actual. Sir? I don't care. I don't care about oh, okay. church fathers. What, what does untruth mean? You, uh, you, what is it, what's an untruth? Something that's not true? Is it a lie? Well, I mean, we could say uh, it would be untrue to say Matt understands our position. So it would be un that would be untrue. Untrue. So God, God doesn't know that you understand my position unless you do and are, are feigning that you don't. Then God would know that because he knows you your heart, your present charitable. intention. What? Come on, dude. Wait, wait, I'm asking what an untruth is. What's an untruth? What is it? I, I don't understand what an untruth is. I know what a truth is. I know what something is not true. So I'm talking to you is true. Okay, I am an elephant. That is not true. What's an untruth? Well, you're you're not an elephant, right? So God knows, God doesn't know that you are an elephant. God, that's something God doesn't know. He doesn't know married bachelors. He doesn't know uh, round squares. Those are well, things well, that are in the realm of untrue. Well, see, 
you're not making any sense. Sorry, no disrespect. But he, he said, when I talk about truth and what, that which is not true, there's a different distinction. It's either the case that something is true or it's not the case that something is true. Mm-hmm. It's not the case that something is untrue because the untruth falls into the category of it's true or it's not the case that it's true. It's a logical syllogism is all there is. There's no in-between. So something is either true or it's not the case that it's true. And we haven't even defined what truth is. Because if you go with the correspondence theory of truth, we're going to have a big problem. I don't know. What do you define truth as being? I mean, there's. I see lots of problems with it. For the, for just, for, just, just so you can understand here. it in, a, in, a, in perhaps a more um, engaging way, untruth would be not true. So God doesn't know a something lie. that's not true as true. He does not know something that's not true. That's a double as negative. True. So let, let me ask you, can you, define what, can you define what truth is? Does, does, does God know that you're not here right now? What's truth? Oh, reality, something that corresponds with reality. Okay. I think that's a quote can you, you used can, before. Okay, that's, does God know that you're not here right now? Truth. No, that would, be, that would be an untruth or, or something that's not true. So God doesn't know that, right? God doesn't know you're not here right now. That would be a, a, a false thing. So God doesn't know untruth. So God doesn't know that you're, um, you know, you're not here. That's something that God doesn't know, right? So God has to know something that it corresponds with reality and, right? I mean, we're not going to say God knows false things is true. You ask me what God doesn't know, yeah, and I'm telling you, is. God knows all the true facts. God knows all the will be's, all the maybe's, all the might be's, but he doesn't know uh, false things as true. Tell me what truth is. I already did so. I'm, I'm going to so dismantle you God this knows guy, all okay. possibilities. You guys are being patient. Okay. Oh, well, okay. If, I'm give, if I can be given some time, I can show you why his position doesn't work. There's a logical problem. In can it. you guys hear me? He has to be able to define what truth is. I can yes. hear you. He had to define what truth is. He, what he did was he used the correspondence theory of truth. The correspondence theory of truth is problem because it means that our perceptions and our understandings of universal transcendentals and patterns, as we perceive them and relate them to the world is how we judge what truth is. That's a humanist philosophy. In actuality, truth is whatever corresponds to the mind of God, because God knows all actualities as well as potentialities, because he has that capacity. So truth responds to the mind of God. We need a biblical position, humanist position to start, because if God it doesn't know what truth is, and if he knows, and there's something, something called an untruth, and then what I did was I showed you, something's either true or it's not the case that it's true. It's a logical necessity. Mm. You only have two possibilities. And I, I see what you're doing, I don't remember what your name is, I don't, I don't I mean, I hope I'm not sounding like that, but I see, what I see, what I hear you doing is talking in the penumbra between truth and, and error, and you're weaving between them, deciding what kind of word phrase you're going to use, and what, what yeah. connotation you're going to use at what particular I time. Can, I want to get very I, specific, because there's I can see questions that. I can, to this. Let me, let me, let me, let me respond to that real, let me respond to that real quickly. Yeah, let me let me respond to that real quickly. So so perhaps my mistake here is that I'm quoting from your website on karm.org, where you said the fact is that truth corresponds to reality. So and, and you said that 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 happens in the Bible. So the fact is that truth corresponds to reality in the Bible. So I'm I'm, I'm taking your uh, definitions, and I'm, I'm trying to meet you where you are with those and affirm what I can. And uh, I don't know, we, we may need to to nuance that or, 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 or rewrite that. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I'm using the statement from CARM. The fact is that truth corresponds to reality in the Bible. So if that's an error, um, I, I would be more than happy to, you know, talk to you about that later and maybe we could, you know, come up with a different definition for, for truth. But I was, uh, that's, that, that's what I was using because I thought that was a common ground that we held. On, if you go to the website, karm.org, I wrote in 2008, truth is whatever conforms to the mind of God is the first subheading in there. And I used to hold erringly ignorance to the respondents theory, but now I've grown and learned biblically. Truth is what corresponds to the mind of God. So I want to know what, what things God can't know. What's the list of things he cannot know? It's not possible for him to know because there's a limitation to his nature. Because the properties emanate out of the nature. Now, 
course, the God's nature is such that there's a restriction upon it that is subject to time or whatever it might be, which depends on your answers. And if it's sub so you're subject to this, then we might get into the issue of pantheism, panentheism, and some other issues, which I think are, are interrelated. You have to understand that the very basic premises that you hold about the very knowability of God's knowledge about all things related to his decrees will affect his nature. This is tempted to say, your God believes this, my God believes that. But I believe you're a Trinitarian, I assume. So I don't want to go that far. But you see the problem here. The properties they're talking about relate to the ontos. Well, your properties are restricted. That means the ontos of God is different. It implies, the implication is that he's restricted to time. Well, that's part of the created order. You've got all kinds of problems here. So I ask what truth is. You give me a correspondence theory, kind of, but that's not a really a good position. And the reason it's not is because it's developed, it's a humanistic philosophy based upon humanistic ideology and sense uh, observation and the prediction or the belief that universals are, we can understand the broader context. Well, okay, but this is why I changed that article, I think I did about several years ago, that uh, truth corresponds to the mind of God, because I learned. And I changed my mind. And so I can do that. God doesn't. So I can do yeah, that. I mean, I this article, around. this article is from 2008. So what I'm curious. Does, I'm curious when you changed that and um, how long how long you haven't been making the same mistake I'm making currently. Years. I, I can't tell you. What I need to do, I'll just admit I need to do this. Started in, doing in this. Profound error on this on 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 what constitutes truth. So I'm hoping maybe you can cut yes. me some slack. Maybe I can catch up to you. Sure. Well, uh, I am, you know, so hey, but here's the thing, okay. Truth is what corresponds to the mind of God. Now, what is what truth is it that God cannot know? God knows all choices. truth. I've already said that. What's I've already said God tomorrow? knows all truth. No, no, no. But, okay, but then I asked you, what is truth? You say, well, that was corresponds to reality. But that's a humanistic philosophy. What is truth is corresponds to the mind of God, because God knows all things. So we have to adopt that view, because that's the biblical sure. position. So well, let's, then, let's, let's, let's look at a biblical God, example. How does let's mind, look at a biblical which, example. God have a mind of, how does God have a mind of which there are things he doesn't know? What are the things in his mind he's ignorant of? That you can now say what God is ignorant of. You can, no, we, we, we seem, God's we seem not to be communicating here because I've already said he knows all the true things, and now you're saying that he's ignorant. So it seems it seems to be just um, yeah, it seems, it seems to be not engaging in what I've said. So we can we can look at no, the city of no Kila. no no you're, you're not being no, specific. No, 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 you're not you specific. You, you say truth is what he knows. Go ahead. Look at the city of Keilah. God tells David. Saul will come down and will overtake the city of Keilah. The men will hand David over and Saul will kill David. That was based in the present reality, presentist ontology of time. It was true when God said it. He wasn't lying. It wasn't an untrue thing. Yet it wasn't an eternally settled reality that it must obtain because when David heard this, he fled. And what was true was no longer possible and wasn't true any longer. So there's a biblical example of so God's re relating the present reality as a truthful thing, and it does not necessitate that that thing obtain. Reality so is God dynamic as God is dynamic. Did God make a mistake? Mm -mm. No, he knew reality perfectly. When he says Saul would kill him and the man would hand him over, if, if David hung out there, that oh. was exactly what was going to happen. <clears throat> So God knew what the reality was, and he made a prediction on it and got it wrong. That makes him a prophet. Is that what I said, Matt? Let me, let me, let me back up. No. I, 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 God was I'm not trying, mistaken. I, I, he was right. But you – okay, I'm misunderstanding you. God said he would do something, right? That's a prediction. No, God Did said – Did the prediction the come true that God is, said? David asked God, and in the present circumstances, God said, Saul will overtake the city of Keilah, the men will hand him over to Saul, and Saul will kill him. Those were will-be statements of the future. The future is not eternally settled, so when David heard this, he didn't believe it was eternally settled, and he fled, and thus the event never obtained. The statement God made in the moment was true, 
because it was in keeping with the present reality, the present character, intentions, and circumstances of reality as God knew it. But because the future is not faded and not settled, David knew that. He was able to alter the outcome. He just left town, didn't obtain. God wasn't lying. God was being truthful. And it's the very fact that God was being true that proves the dynamic position is correct. Otherwise, we end up with God it's being a liar kind of or getting stuff wrong. And I, agree, I disagree with both those. But, you're, you're, you, but you're, you're stuck. This is just one of the areas that you're stuck with. This is why specificity, ladies and gentlemen, is necessary. So when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the things have not come about, doesn't come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, she'll not be afraid of him. So you said that God, he predicted something. He prophesied something. This is what going to happen. Then you said it failed. It didn't happen. So my question then is, is your God a false prophet? No, because he was correct. Or he was correct about the prophecy. So I guess when someone, a prophet, speaks the name of the Lord and it doesn't come to pass, it's okay if it doesn't come to pass because the circumstances changed. Yeah, like like Jeremiah 18, yeah. Ezekiel 18, the story of Jonah, Nineveh, the entirety of Scripture, Matt. Yeah, that that's kind of the thing. That's kind of the thing. Yeah, and when you got to take the whole of Scripture change, and God tells Jeremiah 18. Change. Okay, so that's humanist philosophy. I got a question. It, it quoted sure. the Bible's sure. humanist sure. philosophy, Matt, Warren. You... Warren, you can't quote the Bible. That's humanism. I don't know who you are, but that's a mocking. Is that appropriate for a Christian to mock? I'm mocking like you. That? Did I say don't quote the scriptures? And Matt did... Slick, you're not acting in good I, wait faith. Wait a minute. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. To say I'm not acting in good faith means that you're now reading my heart and my motives. What right. gives you the right let, to tell let, me let, what I feel and what I believe? Okay. Who are you right, to guys, judge my guys, character? Guys, guys, guys. All right, guys, 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 guys. Let's, not, let's, let, let's not make personal attacks. I'm going to ask attacks. another question. Let's not make personal attacks. Let's not insinuate anybody's motives. Let's not say anything like that. Let's make sure we focus on a conversation, open theism. Let's deal with the topic at hand. What is your name who, who insulted will the men, me? What is your will name? Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant has heard? O Lord, God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. He didn't. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. They didn't. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of the city of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told to Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. Those events which God knew would obtain did not obtain because it's not necessary they obtain. The present is what dictates the future, not the future being eternally settled. No, God is not a false prophet, and that's why dynamic omniscience is true. God is not a liar. That is why dynamic omniscience is true. God is free. That is why dynamic omniscience is true. And that's my position. I don't know if I can be any more clearer okay. on that. Okay, good. No, you are. Yeah, and you ignore all, all kinds of interpretive possibilities there. And I get it. So let me, let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus bore our sin in his body on the cross? And please, no insults from the other guy, okay? I'm not discussing do you believe that Jesus That's a red literally. herring and a, and a distraction. No, it's not a red herring. Because how do you know what sins God does? Father, you to me, Christ from what you me, have said, me, his position, he doesn't know the future actions, doesn't know the future sins, he grant. doesn't know these things. This is why I'm asking you, what does he, what is, hold on, what does he not know? How does he not know what exactly occur 2,000 years in the future? And what I'll be saying to you right now, back then when the atonement occurred, how did God impute to Jesus the specific sins of his people if he doesn't even know what they're going to be? I can that grant you the, your whole premise, you know, and I can show God it's still a firm dynamic omniscience. <laughs> because God wasn't eternally okay. so carrying the, okay. the sins of mankind in his body. You've just affirmed dynamic omniscience appealing to the atonement, Matt. I don't need to affirm your atonement theory to show even your dynamic. atonement theory. I don't your position. Well, you don't want to, but you just he did. Because unless you want to say God was eternally suffering no, no, our don't. sins in his body, you just showed Don't tell me sequence. what I want to do. Don't tell me what I want to do. I'm asking you about this. What sins did God impute to Christ? 
what specific sins did he impute alive today, 2,000 years after the cross? It doesn't matter. Did he he know those specific sins or not? It doesn't doesn't matter if if he did, unless you're going to claim that was eternally imputed to Christ. You just affirm dynamic omniscience. I don't need to ar- argue what atonement theory is correct and all that. Doesn't. I can grant you the whole point and show you've just affirmed dynamic omniscience, unless you want to say God is eternally suffering your sin. So no, let's let's grant the point. Welcome to dynamic well, omniscience. So, so it doesn't matter which sins are imputed to Christ. Is that what I said? I granted you your position. Whatever sins you want, Matt. Yeah. Unless you want to I'm say right, they were I'm eternally it out. imputed to I'm Christ. Right, I have monitors. Unless, unless you want to say they were internally imputed to Christ, then you're going to affirm dynamic omniscience. Were, were our sins eternally imputed I'm to Christ? Asking, Is he always, forever, timelessly suffering our sins, Matt? Is no. Jesus eternally on What's the cross? Wrong? You should know that out of Hebrews. Is he eternally I'm just on the you cross, tough questions. Matt? Is that why you're... Is no, rising. you're not. You're avoiding oh, tough he's not answers. On the cross. You're avoiding tough answers. I just Was he you. He's eternally, not eternally on, on the cross, cross Matt? How many times have I said no? He's not eternally on the cross. That is sequence. Three and you times just affirm dynamic omniscience, whether you. you want to admit it or not. No, you don't. You make a logic mistake there. Because what you're saying is a difference in category of his present knowledge of all things and conditions and how he works in the world. Then you get into the A time, B theory of time. We could discuss these things. I don't know if you know about that. But I asked you a very specific question. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, 1 Peter 2, 2, 20. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. For by his stripes we are healed. And by, by, you know. Okay, so. I'm a sinner. I don't know about you, but I certainly am, okay? I'm probably a bigger sinner than you. Now, I have problems. I have certain sins. So today, uh, I'm, I, I've sinned, okay? And, all right. Is that specific sin imputed to Christ, or is it not, not that specific sin is imputed to Christ? It doesn't matter. I can grant that it is or that it isn't, and dynamic omniscience still holds. So this is just a waste of a, of a debate. I've already, I've already said, no, I can grant not. you that all sins are, no sins are, some sins are, it doesn't matter. If you're if you're going to say one sin was imputed yes, to Christ, then you're showing sequential operations where Christ once wasn't related to our sins and now is. That's sequence. That's divine sequence. That's at Dude. the very least the Cambridge change. It's not interacting with the argument, though. It's not, in, it's Dude, not interacting with Jesus the argument. Jesus is like, under time. Saying, He's but... involved I'm not going to argue time. over particular atonement theories. That's not the point of the debate. I you can grant whatever atonement theory you, you want. You... I, I, I think Matt's point No, is, don't grant me whichever I, want, because then you're not. I think, I think what Matt is saying, I think Matt's Go point ahead. is, Warren, is that um, if open theism is true, right, then God... Uh, did not know and he does not know or he didn't know during the time of redemption uh, the sins that were being imputed onto Christ he didn't know these things so I think I think that's the point of Matt going through this sequential argument is the foundational point is that God did not know the sins that were being imputed on Christ during the I don't, atonement I can concede I can concede God knew every sin that would occur all I have to show is that he did not eternally know every sin. Otherwise, you're admitting that we are fated agents necessary to obtain. And Matt, I believe you affirm the freedom of God. You're not a necessary agent, sir. So prior to the divine decree, you didn't need to obtain. So dynamic omniscience still holds. How far back do you want to go? I can show you dynamic omniscience no matter which position you go here. Not because it's unfalsifiable, but because it's grounded in scripture and reality. I think I, I think what, what Matt is trying to say Here's a question. is okay. So so one of one of my favorite hymns says, "My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart." And what Matt is trying to say is that how in the world could you sing that under your view of dynamic omniscience and open theism? You, you when can hold at a the mere time of the crucifixion, with the crucifixion, there were names that that God wouldn't even be aware that that would exist a thousand years later. That's the question. He's not trying to get into penal substitution or Christus Victor yeah. or moral influence mere, or all the different theories. That, that's no, not what you, he's Mary. trying to get into. Thank you. You can hold a mere dynamic omniscient position, and you can be an infralapsarian, you can be a Molinist, and you can be an open theist. You can hold a strong dynamic omniscient position, and you can be an open theist. But just simply coming in and, and saying, unless you want to take the burden and say, God has eternally known you because... 
you are a necessary being equal to the divine knowledge and essence of God, and you were fated to obtain, then, then you can take that burden, but you can be an infralapsarian and affirm dynamic omniscience. Yeah, you it, can be a moralist not, and affirm dynamic omniscience. It's not eternal in the sense that you were you saying, but like, well, like what, what's the significance when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ? Or, or like the Old Testament language of like, like, like cut like headship, right? Like, how is that even it's possible? It's a reference to the incarnation. System? Most people don't get this. It's a reference to the incarnation. It was a statement made in time, but it was a reference to the incarnation. Christ assumed the totality of the human nature so as to redeem it and save it. And so when he says, I've been crucified, it's a reference no, to the incarnation no. and him putting his faith mm, in what Christ no, did not. on the cross. You're right that that is a teaching, but that's not what that is. It's federal headship, election. It's federal headship, election, predestination, representation. A whole other theological thing which you need to understand. Now, I asked you a specific question. Do you affirm affirm literal predestination, Matt? No, no, no. Do you affirm literal predestination that God predetermined anything? So, do you affirm predestination? Uh, you guys are talking over each other. There's a slight delay, guys, so take that into consideration. So when you yeah, ask a question, me... allow him to respond, and then give a, give a couple of courteous seconds before, so he can respond. Yeah, and the fact that you keep repeating yourself and talking over me is telling me you're frustrated. And I get why you'd be frustrated. I'm poking holes in your open theism. I'm showing this very significant. How is it that God, who does not know all things in your worldview, can then know what specific people will be born, cannot know what specific sins they'll commit. How then does he impute those specific sins, specific people, Christ on the cross? How does he do that? Or do you deny that he was imputed our sin, that he became sin in our behalf, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that he bore our sin in his on the cross, 1 Peter 2, 24. Now, it's a specific question from your open theism. Can you how your view of God allows him to impute specific individuals of the future, their specific sins, 2,000 years in advance, to Christ on the cross so that the sins could be atoned for. How does that work in your view? Sure. I'll be happy to answer your question when you, when you actually respond to mine that you said you were going to answer. I just want to know, do you affirm God has literal uh, foreknowledge or predestines anything? I was going to say that I know what you mean by phrase, literal predestination. Hmm? Do, you, do, you, do you believe God predestined anything or has foreknowledge? Foreknowledge can be understood in different con- contexts in different ways, and predestination is used pro rizzo five times in the, in the Bible. He foreordains whatever shall come to pass. He predestines them. You can go to Acts 27 through 28. Yes, he's in control. I don't believe in a God who guesses, makes mistakes, Mistakes and who's worked out better and constantly changes his mind. Cool. So, so you do you, you affirm that God is temporal then, and you've just rejected He's all temporal because to have predestination or to foreknow Made a mistake. that's tense knowledge. So, I appreciate you coming over to the dynamic view. And yes, if you want to take those hold same on, objections to the infralapsarian Calvinist, don't, 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 don't misrepresent me. No, no, I'm allowed. I'm allowed to respond. Let's allow. I'm let's allowed allow to respond. respond. If you want to take this, if if you want to take the same objections you just raised to me. You can take those to the infralapsarian Calvinist. You can take those to the Molinist because they, the infralapsarian in the order of logical decrees says God did not determine who he would elect until after the fall uh, was, was ordained to obtain. So if you want to object and say, well, that means suddenly God doesn't know everything. Now you've just taken on a, a large chunk of your fellow Calvinists because Calvinists can't affirm mere dynamic omniscience. And, and it may be that you're lumping me in with open theism at, at large and particular interpretations and approaches. I'll grant that. But your criticism is also levied at the infralapsarian Calvinist and the Molinist. So I don't deny God doesn't know all things. We're denying that the future is eternally fated for God and he's not free. That's what we're denying. Okay, Matt, you can respond to Warren and then I want to get Andy involved. Andy's been waiting patiently. So uh, at the Matt response, we get Andy, and then we allow Chris to respond to Andy. So go ahead, Matt. I'm going to ask the same question again. You can answer your, this question from your perspective, which shows the damage and the weakness that your position presents. Now, here's the question. It's in the text. If open theism is true, 
then God could not have which sins to impute to Christ of, of future individuals. How then did he, any individual, if that, that individual's sins were not known by God and could not then be impeached? Can you answer that specifically? Yeah, I affirm dynamic omniscience, which allows for God to know all of that in the order of the same logical uh, decrees that you as an infralapsarian, or you're, if you're, maybe you're a supra, but infralapsarians would be able to hold. You can actually affirm mere dynamic omniscience. So I, I don't need to go into explaining when or how. I just need to show that there was a logical change in the mind of God as affirmed by your own position, which operates on dynamic omniscience because it's orthodox. It's not my position. And you don't know what my position is. You keep telling me I don't ask me. And that's something you shouldn't be doing. I'm asking you out of your position, what's your question? I ask a question. I write down what your response is. I work with what it is specifically you say. You've told me several times what I believe and think. And, and I hold to this, but would well, you haven't even asked me if I do? I don't hold to infra or supra. So you, I have a idea about the decrees of than most people do. But you haven't even asked me. You just make assumptions. Yeah. What I was trying to get you specifically, what do you mean by this and this and that? I've asked you, what do you mean by truth? What do you mean, what things, specific things that you not know? I've asked you specifics, and you've given me a hard time just trying to get the answers of those things. And now when I ask you a question based off of what you said, now we can all see the difficulty that your position presents. How do you justify from your position? You say present. He knew all things back. Well, back then, the time of Christ, that was present. How did Jesus presently, 2,000 years ago, bear my sin in his body on the cross? If God doesn't even know what free will choices are going to be made to the point, doesn't even know if I'm going to be alive, doesn't even know if I'm going to choose to do this or insult somebody else. How does he know what sin to impute? How does he know? And if he doesn't know, how then is my sin atoned for? It, it, it seems like that's a windmill that, that, that is not something that represents my position. To summarize dynamic omniscience, you need to affirm three things, Matt. God is omniscient, meaning he knows all the facts. You have to affirm presentism, which is the dynamic theory of time or the A theory. And because there are tensed facts that change their truth value over time, God knows those. And then at some point in the life of God, uh, the future was alethically open and he was free to create or not create. And so therefore, the, the truth value about future contingent propositions was not internally settled. So that's dynamic omniscience in a very mere form, which infralapsarian Calvinists can affirm, which Molinists can affirm, which open theists can affirm, which you've said means that God doesn't know everything. And I've already said God is omniscient. He knows all the facts. I've even said he knows the tensed facts. Now, if you want to say God doesn't know tensed facts and I'm limiting God's knowledge, then you need to connect those dots about how God cannot know tensed facts and I'm the one that is now limiting his knowledge. If you can answer a question that's designed to expose your folly in your thinking and you refuse to answer it and repeatedly can't answer it, it demonstrates the weakness of your position. It does, which is why I, I summarized my it. position again because apparently yeah, you can't does. engage with it. You can't engage with my position. I just gave you my position, giving you the benefit of the doubt that maybe yes, you didn't hear it at the start of the show, and you're not even engaging with it. Now you're just attacking me. No, I'm, not, you know, I'm attacking your position. I'm trying to show your position to be fallacious, and you've repeatedly failed to answer the difficult question based on your answers already. You've failed to do this, and what you do, do what I, it, and I mean no disrespect, seriously, but I, what I see you do is you shift the conversational points that I'm trying to get to, to another area so that you can, well, try and answer. But you haven't answered the specific question. How does God, 2,000 years ago, how does he impute my specific sins to Christ if he doesn't even know what specific sins I'm going to commit back then? You say dynamic uh, omniscience, that he knew all all then. That by definition means he doesn't know the stuff now, my now, the now and the not yet uh, theology we get into. But back then, I didn't exist. So how did he know what sins to, to impute my sins to Christ? How did he know that from an open theist uh, position? How did God specifically know which sins to impute the great sinner Matt Slick, no joke, to Christ? to be atoned for if he didn't even know what the future was going to be exhaustively and absolutely. How? I've, I've noted it by, he could do it the same way infralapsarians have claimed. That wasn't a good enough answer for you. Do you know how infralapsarians do it, Matt? I could say he could do it that way. I could say he could do it the way the Molinists do. 
Both of those can hold to a mere dynamic on this. Interlapsarianism takes a precondition of God's all no actualities and potentialities. And since he knows realities which exist in his mind, he brings into a set, into existence, a certain set of, of actualities. This is how he would have his infra knowledge of all things decreed because all possibilities that could exist could only exist as far as the mind of God exists. If you want to get into the logic of infralap versus superlap and you want to get into the issue of how predestination election and his eternal knowledge works, I'd be right. better to talk to you. It's a whole different topic, and I'm well versed in it, not, and I don't have any problem dealing not, with the logic of it. I deal with, I do. Not, but it, but answering the question, you again are failing to answer. You say the infra way. But I don't believe you even understand logical problems with what you're saying. See, I've asked you, right. how does Je how does Jesus bear get God imputed to him to impute a legal declaration? A legal declaration is breaking the law. First John three four. Uh, First John three four. Sin is lawlessness. And Jesus said on the cross in John nineteen thirty to tell us die. It is finished. A legal phrase. In Colossians 2.14, Paul says that Jesus canceled the certificate of debt. The Greek word is kerographon, a handwritten IOU of legal indebtedness. Jesus in John in Matthew 12, forgive us our debts. In 11.4, he says, forgive us our sins. Jesus equates sin with legal debt. Legal debt is the breaking of the law. What laws did I break that were in Christ 2,000 years ago? Can you give me a specific one specific day at a specific time? I certainly can. I know what sins I've committed. But your view restricts God to a temporal position of temporal lying, I can tell you all kinds of stuff. All right, guys. All right, Warren, go ahead and respond. You can't answer the question. The theology is insufficient. All right, Warren, go ahead and respond. And that'll be in end of that. In the end of that one. So we're gonna let Andy uh jump into the conversation. Go ahead, go ahead, Warren. I can only answer it so many times. Um I've tried several different ways. Dynamic omniscience holds that God is omniscient. He knows all the facts. To say, well, when did he know all the facts? Well, are, is it a fact? Yeah, okay, God knows it. Presentism, the dynamic uh theory of time, because they're tense facts, God knows them. He knows Matt is arguing right now. He knows Matt was intending to come on. When this is over, he'll know Matt is no longer doing that. There's some moment in God's life where the future is alethically open. The future contingent uh, 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 propositions were not completely settled. In an infralapsarian position, there was a logical moment in the mind of God where the future was yet indeterminate. Okay? That, that right there is showing the orthodox nature of dynamic omniscience. You can't escape it. There is no orthodox position that doesn't begin with the freedom of God and an affirmation of the divine thoughts, the divine knowledge of God. So you say, how can God do that? He's God. He can do it by way of decree. He can do it by way of his omniscience. He can bring these things to pass. The, the dynamic uh, the omniscient view of God, like a mere dynamic omniscient, God could have created uh, an absolute meticulous deterministic universe where all people are doing exactly what he foreordained and so that you're doing every sin he's ever decreed, which is the exhaustive divine position. And I'm saying I could even grant your position and still hold to mere dynamic omniscience, and that's not sufficient for you. So if, if, if the mechanism that I'm pointing to, which you, I'm assuming, would affirm, or you would not kick these guys out of the kingdom, if that's not sufficient, I don't know what is. I'm, I'm, I've granted you over and over and over to show how God still is free and you're not a necessary agent. He didn't have to create you. Like he didn't have to die for you. He chose to. That's not what I'm talking about. Right. It's not what I'm talking right. about. You okay. keep doing that. You keep shifting and you don't listen to what I'm specifically saying. I, this occurs with atheists, with Roman Catholics, with others when I ask very difficult pointed questions. They do the exact same thing that you're doing. You avoid the question, things that are related, but not specific. And that's a mission. You asked me how, and I said he could do it the exact same way that, right. that, that, that the um, exhaustive divine determinist does it. If that's okay. not a clear answer, Matt, please tell me why it's not a clear answer. Please right, tell right, me why guys. God exhaustively determining everything is all not right. a clear answer. And then I'll know to use that against my Calvinist brothers in the future. All right, all right, all right, all right, guys. We're going to, does, we, can he answer that, Marlon? I would be very interested to see Matt answer that question. 
Why isn't okay. exhaustive divine determinism an efficient method I'm for trying, God knowing I'm the future? Best, Eddie. I'm trying my best, Eddie. Matt, go ahead and respond, no, and, and that's going to be it, man. Come on, go ahead, Matt. How does God possibly determine everything if he does the future is going to hold? Your question is a, is a wrong question. All right. You make a lot of logic mistakes. All right. Andy. All right. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for jumping on, man. So, uh, yeah, we can, we can hear you. We can hear you. So what is what, what is your concern or are you obviously I think you're arguing against open theism, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have some questions first. Um, clarificatory questions, if that's cool. Um, when we're using the term atemporal, um, are we setting that up as a contrast to what temporal? And does, I guess the second question with that is, does a temporal mean the same thing as eternity for you guys? Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I'm, uh, this may be leading me down the garden path. You may have been thinking about a good follow up knowing where I'm going to go, but I don't see eternity. I'm just, no, I'm genuinely curious. <clears throat> oh, cool. Cool. And I, I'm willing to fall on this sort. I see biblical eternity speaking of ages of, of divine temporality. So I see eternity being, um, sequential operation. Um, there are, uh, philosophical. Now we're leaving the, uh, the realm of scripture admittedly, but like William Lane Craig would hold to a single, uh, temporal moment prior to, and then, um, there's, there's some interesting things you can do when you're talking about concerns about an infinite regress, but I don't hold that in, uh, that, um, all temporality and eternity are the same. Eternity is a span of time. All temporality is absent time. I, I do a, a, affirm uh, divine temporality. Okay. That, yeah. See, that's interesting. That answers a lot for me um, in the discussions that came beforehand. And um, so my goal is I'm trying to find some some connections here no, that may it, have been missed. It, um, if I could add to that, <laughs> so, I, I, I try to grant, I try to grant even the logical moment uh, view, which rejects divine temporality and show how there was still a logical moment in an atemporal classical theist model where the future had not yet been determined and God freely chose to do that in the next logical moment so that I can show that even in an atemporal model, mere dynamic omniscience is, is found. So that's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to do is to build consensus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose I, I just, I guess I have concerns about the term atemporal, um, especially if it's distinct from eternity, because you defined a uh, temporality, how I would define eternity. Um, so I would say time is successive. Um, even if time were infinite, right? Cause time can technically could be infinite, right? Cause you just need an infinite amount of successive states. Um, it would still be successive. Um, and you said a tempor a temporality is not successive. Um, I would say eternity is not successive. Um, because it's, um, eternity is still a measurement, but it's a measurement of something permanent and unchanging, if that makes sense. And whereas a temporality does not have any sort of measurement to it. So you how does a eternal God exist? How, how do you determine whether or not an eternal God is distinguishable from nothingness? I, myself, well, I think, I think with, being timeless is sorry. a non-concept, if that makes sense. What's a non-concept? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. The timelessness being outside of time. Mm -hmm. I think it's a non, it's not conceptual. It's not, not something that can be, that makes any sense. I think it's a non-concept like a square circle, you know? Oh yeah. I don't think it's a contradiction. It might be hard for us to conceive, but conceivability isn't really necessary. Our conceivability isn't necessary for truth. Um, so I think how would you just can... distinguish it from nothingness? I'm asking. Nothing is just the absence of, of anything, right? So eternity, eternity doesn't have to do with, um, nothingness or somethingness that's being or non-being, right? So if you have non-being, you don't even have something permanent and unchanging. So I guess that would be the difference, right? So non-being would be the absence of something permanent, and unchanging eternity would have some sort of permanent, unchanging thing. So think of like, if you want to be philosophical about it, a really good example is like Parmenides one versus non-being, being and non-being and Parmenides would be a good example of that. Um, 
the non-being is literal nothingness. The being is a one unchanging permanent thing. Um, so the reason I want to make that distinction is to go back to something else you guys were talking about, um, which is the tensed facts. Um, I guess I'm curious, why can't a classical theist deal with tensed facts for God? Because God, God would lack any sort of temporal location in a atemporal state. So there, there wouldn't be any point on the timeline relative for him to have a before and after. But if eternity is an unchanging permanent state of all states, he does have that point. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see why I would go with, I would say eternity is that, the better But, but if, if you're using God eternity, if, if you're using eternity as like an unending state, unending deals with duration. Not, so that, that is uh, actually yeah, having time in measurement. I would say permanent unchanging, not unending. Not I, I would completely leave the idea of successive states out of it because I don't think successive, successive states have anything to do with eternity. I think successiveness is time and change. But if well, like, by definition, like, here's, here's, classical theist is saying that God doesn't change, then there would be no no concept of any successiveness. Like one 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 thing here too, like Deuteronomy thirty three twenty seven, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say destroy them. And so you see here, the eternal God is thy refuge. So we talk about eternity, uh, like eternity or eternal. Um, and everlasting that that so everlasting would definitely speak of duration. When you look at the um, the term for eternal, you're actually getting into a, a term that's associated with the east. It's like um, like it expands further than you can than you can see. Well, it just it, it it goes on, but it's a span. It's it's almost like a measurement. And so when you're looking at biblical descriptions of eternity. It would be from ancient times or from a great distance. It would be entailing sequence or measurement, um, but it wouldn't be in a single, like timeless, um, act this purest sort of moment. Um, it, it would actually I think, have. I don't think eternity. I don't think many people would say eternity can be measured. Um, you might be thinking about I eternity. So that that is the idea. It has both time the concept of time in it and the concept of eternity in it, which is it has a beginning like time, but it has no end like eternity. So that that's the concept you're talking about, but that's like a mean between time and eternity, right? That's something in the middle ground. We're saying God is completely in the eternal for, for the classical theist position. Yeah. Do you would believe you, that you biblical authors believe that? I, I think classical theism is correct. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't think, that doesn't, I don't think that entails that he cannot change. I think that's a misunderstanding of the classical position. Right, but do, do, you, do you believe that the biblical authors held this position about eternality of God? Um, I think so. I would say so. Just ba but that's based on my reading of scripture, I suppose, and you know, medieval, the medievals and some church fathers. I'm not as well versed in the church fathers. I'm pretty well versed in the medievals, though. So when we have examples in the Bible of God remembering the past, looking forward to the future, endearing things, having patience, mm -hmm. uh, showing anger, reacting to mm -hmm. situations, changes of minds, even re regret of his prior actions, like in Genesis 6, you think the, the authors of those passages believe that God was in a timeless state? Yeah, I, like I said, you can have the concept of eternal. I don't want to use timeless. Um, I think that carries connotations that don't mean um, the unchanging, um, I guess, unchanging permanent state. Um, it also doesn't mean he can't come into time. You know, and it also doesn't mean that um, he can't think about future contingents. Um, I think what what we have to what we have to this is my another question I wanted to ask you guys because I want to think about this a little bit further and this I, this is a tough question so I'm not it's not a trap or anything I, I'm when you say changing his mind how are you thinking about like the mechanics of how somebody changes his mind like what is the changing what so as far as like the act of the intellect to the object what is the thing that's causing the change and doing the change. Well, just like our change of minds, we have regrets and uh, 
our actions correspond. So God sees a situation in Genesis 6. It prompts him to have an internal dialogue. And then he, based on his evaluation of what he saw, he has those regrets. It says that he was grieved in the heart. What grieved him? His own prior actions, because he connected the current state of the world to his prior creation. Is that what you're yeah, looking so for guess, for an answer? I guess I'm, I'm getting trying to get a little more specific about the very act of the intellect. So um, as an example, like we see an object, and that object can cause different changes of states in us. Um, we could even say that object completes our state in some way um, because we're interacting with that object. Um, yeah. If we if we take like a step back in time, so the, the, the classical theist position um, often gets detailed out in a, a, some people call it an Aristotelian metaphysic. It's not really, it's Aristotelian and it's not very, not very Aristotelian at the same time. It's uh, um, very changed by the time we get it in the medieval era. But just as an example, um, when they say that God's intellect is holy within him, all they're saying is that the object does not perfect the act of the intellect. If there was an object that perfected the act of an intellect, particularly God's intellect, there would be something that was more perfect than God because the act would be perfected by something higher than it. So he can yeah. still know future, he can still know future things. Um, they just I, I don't have, change. It. Yeah, I might have read the Dwezel quote that basically says that same thing. That is the classical position. But I don't think the biblical authors held to this theory of metaphysics. In the Bible, God is constantly... I don't think they held to ours, though, either. I'm sorry? I don't think they held to our modern version of, of mind, either. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't think so, either. So we agree So, so that's there. what I mean. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you there. That's, that's, so, that's kind of what I mean when, uh, um, when you said just how we think today. Like, that's a little bit too broad. I think I think it needs to be unpacked a little bit more. Right. So you see with objects, God sings over us. God, God gets joy from our worship. You see uh, King David bargaining with God. If I die, you're not going to get my worship. That's something God desires. And so it's a Platonistic category that states that if there's things outside of God that God gains from outside of him, it gives him some sort of perfection. And that metaphysical system was just not affirmed by the biblical authors. It's not, um, it's not Platonistic. Um, it's, uh, it's an amalgamation of many, many ideas. Um, so Plato it's, doesn't it's not explicit in Plotinus. Um, yeah, but Plotinus isn't following Plato necessarily. I mean, he's got a whole Definitely. bunch of influences. Yeah, Plotinus claims that he's basically quoting all these Neoplatonists. They thought they were just doing standard metaphysics and so you talked about parmenides and the one that's basically the theory of god that the platonists are proposing and so in parmenides you look at how that one functions and operates and it's this uh, pure divine simplicity being and so it can't have these outside relationships because that creates the multiplicity and so plotinus is just extending plato's theory of one but plotinus which aristotle talks about as well no, sorry? Plotinus has simplicity. Aristotle's God's rejected by almost every author that picks him up, of course, because Aristotle's God can only contemplate himself. But this is the whole point I'm making is um, take, take things like enunciables. If you have an enunciable proposition, which can be true or false based on the time it's enunciated, then um, God can still know those things, right? He can know the mind of man. He can know the thoughts of man, which are enunciable statements. Um, it's just that he knows at that particular time, whether it'll be true or false, not that like he can have multiple propositions. So the typical conversation that it always was around was, um, the, the nominalist conversation, um, Christ will come, Christ has come, Christ is come, Christ has come, right? Those are three different sort of propositions that have different tense tenses to them. Um, and. God can know all three of those and they can all three be eternally true in God, but we know them as they happen, right? So you were talking about discursive reasoning earlier. So we all we're saying there is God can still deal with enunciables. He can still deal with future contingents without having discursive reasoning. It, it, if I could ask yeah, a clarification I'm, statement here, okay, Andy, it, it sounds like, it sounds like you're saying God can know tensed facts, but not as tensed facts. He, he wouldn't know, um, I like Warren is speaking, he would know 
on December, whatever today is at whatever time Warren speaks. And this is what Warren says at that time. So it, it's not, it's not an affirmation of tensed knowledge, but it's an affirmation of the knowledge. Is, is that, is that essentially the position you're trying to, to point it's, out? Yeah. If I, I'm not as familiar with the term tense knowledge, but if, if by tense knowledge, you mean something like, um, God knows it as it's happening because there's something outside of him that causes that knowledge, right? If you mean that by tense knowledge, then I would say he does not have that. Like does, does God know it is three o'clock Eastern yes. time? Okay. Then that would be a tense knowledge. If he knows on this day, you know, it will be three o'clock East coast time, then that would be a tenseless knowledge. And the only way, as far as I understand it, and looking at the various literature on the philosophy of time, the only way that God can know tense knowledge is if he has a temporal location relative to that knowledge. So like we see this in Revelation 1.8, where he says, uh, "Who I'm the God who was, who is, and who is to come. So he speaks of a temporal location relative to the past, a, a temporal location anchored in the present, a temporal location relative to a, a potential future, and that speaks of potentiality with God. So I, I take it in those terms to speak of God as a as having a temporal location and potentiality. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I suppose I would just respond quickly to something else that had kind of come up. Sorry, so much has come up. I'm kind of forgetting everything. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that God has no potential in Him. How do you how do you mean that? So the classical conception is that God is pure act. And so potentiality means that there could be divergences, which would create parts within God. It will allow degradation, which can't happen. And so that's just the, that's just the classical form. We don't hold that metaphysics. We don't think that God's pure actuality. Um, William Lane Craig doesn't think God's pure simplicity or actuality. It's, it, but it is the classical formation that God can't have anything in him that's not God. And he can't have anything in him that could vary from what it is. Yeah, so I wonder about that statement. Why, why is that? I don't see how that follows, really. Um, I, get, I get the act and potency, um, but we also have the idea in classical theism that God's, God's will is infinite potentiality. So there is a there is an idea. It's called um, virtual existence. So the the world could have been another way, and God could have created the world that way. And so that world exists virtually in the will of God, and that's a potential. So there are potentials that exist in God on classical theism. Thomas Aquinas, the medieval, is super um, super clear on that. Yeah, I'll, so I, I'll pull I guess what I'm, is, what, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, sorry, go ahead. Oh, Aquinas uh, affirmed divine simplicity, and so he thought God was pure act with no potentiality. So it it, no, it tends to quite. be that the people who I'm sorry, not not quite uh, in the way that you're saying it though. Okay, I'll, I can pull up some quotes. Um, James Dwezel has his book on uh, divine simplicity, God without parts. And then he has the book, All That Is In God, which are both treatises on this subject. And he, he affirms all of Aquinas' stuff, basically. And and I on, on God is Open, I think I quote Aquinas on divine simplicity. I'll have to pull up those quotes. Yeah, I'm just saying... A lot of people miss this in, in the medieval philosophy. There is a there is something called virtual, not in the sense that we have virtual reality now, um, but there is a virtually existent. There are virtually existent things in God, um, and those are potencies for the for the otherwise. I guess you could say it that way. Um, so he's the cause of what is because he's pure act, and he's the cause of what could be because all things exist in him virtually or by pure act. Is so that that's potentiality? Is that potentiality Sorry, relegated into like a logical moment where God could have done something other and created like say world B, whereas we're in world A? Is is that is that where you're anchoring that potentiality is in like a logical moment where he could have done other? Or can he do I other think, now? 
that he can do other at like he, I wouldn't say he could I mean maybe he could change the past by his absolute power. I don't know I don't know if that's a contradiction or not. No 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 I, I mean or... like in the present. Let's say let's say um when you when you say that God could do other, there's potentiality. Are you anchoring that in a logical moment where you would you would use the term eternal, I would use autemporal, but in like a timeless uh single act where you have all these logical moments in sequence. Is there a logical moment where there was potential with God to do other, but for whatever reasons within God, he determined not to do those and brought about these things. Is that where you're anchoring that potentiality is in that oh, logical saying, priority? In that, so you're saying like in that first point, I mean, this is, this is the part, because now, now we're using successiveness to talk about eternality. Um, so there is no first point. So I would say, yes, it is, it is currently the case even currently is is temporal right but it is currently the case that there is a virtual existence of things in him that could be otherwise right so i i, I did find a de Wezel quote that we referenced earlier which is also now relevant to this conversation mm -hmm. i'll just read it real quick he james de Wezel, uh he's not he's not an open theist calvinist it should be readily confessed that the exact function of free will in God, who is himself pure act, is beyond the scope of human knowledge. Just as we cannot comprehend God as ipsum esse subsistence, we cannot comprehend the identity between God as eternal, immutable, pure act, and his will for a world as free and uncoerced. Though we discover strong reasons for confessing both simplicity and freedom in God, we cannot form an isomorphically adequate notion of how this is the case. In fact, this confession of ignorance is pre precisely what one finds in the Thomas and Reformed traditions. And so they, they typically have to appeal to mystery to get both of these things. Uh, a God who can act in potentiality and himself be pure act. It, it tends to be just this appeal to mystery, which I think doesn't work in this case because I think they're mutually contradictory. Yeah, I suppose I would say that that's dealing with something a bit different, right? That's asking if we can understand God. I would think an open theist would also say we can't fully understand God. Am I wrong about that? Or uh, he's saying that where how do you get how do you divide the bridge between a God who's pure act and a world with potentiality, and God's freedom to create? So if God had freedom to create, that's potentiality. God could have built this. God could have built that. It's potentiality. And a God who's pure act can't have potentiality. He has to be a pure uh, he's a substance that cannot change. Change equals degradation. Change equals God changing away from the God substance. And that just can't be allowed in classical Aquinas yeah. theology. Uh, but it, it can, though, through this virtual existence, because that is not... So you're saying when, he, when Aquinas and the scholastics are saying that God has no potentiality or no potency, that means nothing can act on God or make him whole in his being, right? That doesn't mean that he can't no, I, create things. That... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I would disagree with that. They are actually talking about him not being able to do things other than what he does. There's no potentiality. I mean, then they just, then they just, no. then they just got Dole Aquinas all... wrong goes against that, Chris. I mean, Dolezal says, I've read in God Without Parts, he says that, that they, but there is a link in Reformed Classicalists where he cites this. He says that potentiality is like the conception of like, like being acted upon, like if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, potentiality is being acted upon by something to complete something about you, whether that's your understanding, your will, Right. There's there are objects that are linked to all these faculties because yeah, you have there, to think um, the, the scholastics any, yeah. also have a powers ontology. Right. That's very different than our modern notion. And it's probably a little bit different than what script, the scriptural uh, people who wrote the Bible also had in mind. But I'm using this as an example. Right. The classical theist can still hold this and maintain that he acts in the world. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, is it Merrick? I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yep. Yep. I remember uh, the Lutheran group chat back in the day, seeing you on there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, Oh, you're the same I, Eric. Nice. Good to see yes. you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm the same one. Good to see you, man. I'm glad there's another Lutheran here. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we're just misunderstanding each other. Like I think we just showed that Chris has been using potentiality in, in a, in a different sense. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I think, I think there's more overlap here than might be first thought. Now, I'm not a Calvinist, so I don't know the particulars to how they engage with this. Um, but I do think the Lutherans are quite close to the Thomistic sense. Okay, yeah. so yeah, and I would definitely John... be more on a Thomistic, schol Reformed scholastic side, not like a neo-Calvinistic uh, tradition. And I mean, in regards to like Plotinus and stuff, that's specifically why it's like Neoplatonic thought and not just Platonic thought. So John Frame, yeah, I'm skipping a bunch of the quote, but he keeps talking about potentiality versus actuality. There cannot be such parts in God for several reasons. First, he, there can be nothing in him that is less or less noble than himself. Second, nothing in him can be removed from him for nothing in him cannot be. Third, the fact that he has many attributes is not something caused for he is the first cause. Fourth, in God, he can have no process of potentiality becoming actuality because he is pure act with no pass of potentiality. So would you disagree with that statement? Yeah, so would you affirm that statement? I would, I, would, I would affirm that. That would change that very last phrase. Or I, it wouldn't change it. I'm sorry. I would affirm that. But passive potentiality is different than active potentiality. Those are two separate ideas in scholastic thought. Um, an active potency is an indefinite potency. And that's where the potency of God resides. So this is what we call like the virtual cause. Um, Scotus, Dun Scotus, and William Ockham, even though they're nominalists, they have similar ideas for our own will. They call it an indeterminate potency, which gets them into a little bit of trouble. But um, the indeterminate potency is different than a passive potency. So Aquinas has both of those ideas. So it's like, it's very, I know said, it's very nuanced. Yeah, Bavink says, classicism, according, I'm, I'm not saying that this just you, so you can comment on this. Scholasticism mm -hmm. accordingly has begun to speak of God as utterly pure and simple actuality to indicate that he is perfect and absolute being without any capability, potential for non-being or to be different. You would affirm that? Yeah, I mean, that's it's so I mean, vague. That's the problem, you know, like yeah, no ability to be different in what, yeah, in what way is he being different and what does he mean by capability? Is that... That would, I wouldn't say capability means potential. Uh, I, that seems maybe capacity or faculty. Well, and and you're faculty jumping over to a, a Dutch theologian from the neo-Calvinistic tradition now. That's like, yeah. it's, it's changing. It. I mean, Bavink's very different. Yeah, I'm just asking if Bob you want to affirm it or... Maybe not on this specific issue, but... Yep. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't affirm what Bob Inc. says there fully, um, depending what, I mean, I needed to know what he means by change, uh, or I'm sorry, um, I can't remember the term, with a difference or something like that causes him to be different or something and a capability. Potential to non being something. Yeah, so there, there's a lot in there. But I, I just, I just wanted to come on and say that the classical theist does have, does seem to have ways to deal with this. Now, if by classical theism, you mean somebody who doesn't admit potency in any way, shape or form, that's going to be a bigger problem. <laughs> potential to do things other than what God does. Potentiality to be potential, potency. Do you, yeah, potency do you just means power. Potency with immutability uh, being, being interlinked and dependent on one another? Um, oh, that's a big question. Um, uh, that's players. all I have. I don't have big answers. So that's why Marlon brought me <laughs> on here. I just have big questions. No, I, I mean, it, it's certainly linked. Um, Cause the classics would say, obviously God is immutable. Um, but um, what, yeah, to unpack immutability is quite tough. Um, what was the I question? Guess, I guess to, to tie it to, um, is, he asked if there's a relation between immutability and, and potency. Um, and I think there is, it's just that we don't think about it the same way as the scholastics would because they have a power as ontology. So the potency of a faculty like the will or the intellect to be acted upon by an object that, that is being mutable, but because God mm -hmm. is pure act, nothing acts on him to change him. That doesn't mean he can't change himself because he's an act of potency, right? So a passive right. potency receives an act of potency acts. All right, guys. Yeah, and I hey. would say act and potency are not like equal. Right. 
All right, guys. I know there's a lot more to evaluate and to discuss. This conversation can never end. I think we can go on this conversation for about the next five hours, six hours. But at some point, we got to shut it down, and that's what we go do now. We go shut this thing down. I appreciate you guys for jumping on, and everybody else that jumped on, Vocab, Matt, uh, Andy, Merrick. Merrick was originally reluctant. You know what I'm saying? He saw how how spicy the conversation was getting and how hot it was and how great no, it was. I, I love I love Andy. I love Merrick. I, I really I really enjoy these brothers. They're yeah. You know, they're they're coming in yeah, and they're, they're, they're you can tell they genuinely care to dialogue and you know, I, I don't think uh Merritt or or uh Merrick, I should say. I almost named my son Merritt. Merrick or, or Andy are, are here with their pitchforks at all. And uh, if I got out of line, if I got a little too hot if I got a little too defensive, I, I want to apologize. That's not typically my style. I just, yeah, I, I think me and, maybe me not and Merrick are maybe like a spade, but yeah, me and Merrick are friends on Facebook. He hits like once in a while the things I post. So. You make the bet. You have the funniest Facebook posts. Okay, you, you just post the most <laughs> hilarious stuff. <laughs> well, guys, yeah, thanks for the love. Yeah, enjoy, guys. Looking, yeah, thanks for the conversation and searching for the truth. It's always fun to do that with other Christians. All right, guys. I appreciate you guys, man. Once again, a special thanks for Mr. Warren and Mr. Chris for coming on as they were the ones taking all the arguments for tonight. And if you guys out there in the, not in the, in the comment like these kind of discussions, man, make sure you guys subscribe, hit the like and all that good stuff. And I do encourage you guys to go. If you guys want to better equip yourself for arguments and better understand the opposing, the the uh, the opposition, if you will, the the position you disagree with, it's nothing wrong with diving into what they believe, so you can better represent it in 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 whatever you do with it, right? If you decide to argue against it, right? You want to better understand what they represent. So um, many of you probably disagree with open theism. Many of you probably disagree with determinism or whatever the position is. Make sure you dive into it so you can better represent it and argue for it or against it, whatever it is, right? And that's it, guys. I thank you guys once again for coming on, man. And we look forward to doing this again sometime. So uh, this is goodbye, but not goodbye forever, guys. I'm sure we'll jump back on and do it again. You guys take care, man, and God bless. All right, take care. Have a good night. See you guys. Abide in Christ. Bye-bye. All right. All right, guys. Another great debate, or great, not really a, a form of debate, but a, a panel discussion in the books. And thank you guys for tuning in to this. Um, so you guys let me know what you guys think about this. Um, I know that my internet was a bit choppy tonight, so not only did it prevent some of the guys from logging in, but I had a hard time getting those links to those guys. I gotta check and see what's going on with my internet provider because my internet has never been like choppy. I mean, it's been quite some time since my internet's been this choppy. I just thank God that the internet didn't crash. You know what I mean? That it didn't crash on us. Um, we were able to get through the program. Um, so um, I'll check that out. But nonetheless, I pray that even with the choppy internet, uh, you guys were able to follow along with what's being said. Um, as you guys know, I've always made it a point to ensure that we understand that if you argue against something, if you disagree with a position, uh, make sure you know what you're arguing, dif disagreeing with. And uh, I, I'm strongly for uh, bringing folks on. I disagree, like I'm not an open theist, I disagree. I strongly disagree with open theism. But that doesn't mean that I would shun Warren and Chris from coming on to give us the understanding of open theism and allow some opponents of that to come on and argue against it, right? Um, and so I think that's good, it's, it's, it's debate, right? That's what debate is all about. And um, I think it's important that we do that. We, it's important for us to have these conversations, right? And be able to dialogue um, uh, with each other, even though we disagree. Um, so I think it's important that we do that. And I pray that this open discussion and not only these open discussions, but the formal debates that I host are, are being able to allow you to do that, right? Um, I pray that it's a blessing to you and that it's encourage you to dive deeper into God's word, to study God's word and uh, draw closer to the Lord. That's the ultimate goal, right? Draw closer to the Lord. Don't just be a theological geek and just say, well, I know theology, therefore I'm close to the Lord. No, theology 
is it's a helpful tool to understand how God operates, to understand who God is, to study the things about God. But when you draw, but I don't want you guys thinking that because you watch a debate or because you watch an open, uh, open discussion or because I like theology that I can draw closer to God through debate. I don't think you can draw closer to God through debate. I think what you do after the debate is what draws you closer to the Lord. Um, I think if you say, you know what, I heard this, I heard this said in, Matthew, in the gospel of Matthew, what does it really say? So you go to your scriptures, you go to the word, you ask God for understanding, you ask the Lord, please, Lord, help me understand this, right? And so, and so that's what this is all about, right? It's about Christ. It's about Christ is the center of this, right? And so if emotions, if, if emotions get riled up and, and emotions get going, hey, it's a part of the, it's a part of emotions. It's a part of the conversation, right? But I just want to make sure um, that Christ is being glorified through these discussions, right? And that, and that's the important thing. And so, um, yeah, I pray that you guys are are are, are blessed by this. My boy Jeremiah Nortier, my boy Jeremiah Nortier is in the is in the live chat. Um, hopefully, it pops up here. He has a comment here. Um, my, see, this is what I'm saying. My, my internet has been acting real dumb right now and it's not behaving correctly. So I'm trying to get this comment up. There it is. Marlon loves Arkansas or Arkansas. I sure do. I sure do. I'm man. We're going to make another trip out there. Jeremiah, we're going to make, make another trip. Hey, make sure you guys go check out the apologetic dog and subscribe to his channel, man. This is my boy right here. And he has a lot of great stuff on there, man. Um, I mean, this guy's a pro at debating uh, Church of Christ guys, right? This dude's a, a, a pro, right? If you guys didn't know, um, Jeremiah, just Jeremiah uh, was the first participant, him and <clears throat> obviously him and another debater were the first participants in my first, in TGT's first live debate, right? First live debate. And you can find that on his channel as well. So if you're interested, and the apologetic dog. This is my dude. I'm telling y'all, go and subscribe to this man's channel, man. He's a blessing to the church. And um, yeah, do it. That's my boy, Jeremiah. Hey, next time, Jeremiah, when we come out there, when I come out there, I'm going to play you some basketball. I'm going to see if you still got skill set. I don't think you got the skills no more, bro. I don't think you got it, dog. You know what I'm saying? I don't think you got it. <laughs> I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw my Kobe, throw my throw my Jordan. No, I'm throw my Kobe's on, bro. And I'm gonna get out there and get you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, all no, that said, man, I appreciate all you guys uh, for um, for j jumping on, man. Remember, before you leave, make sure you subscribe to the Gospel Truth. Don't forget to do that because that is an important thing to do, right? Don't forget to subscribe to the Gospel Truth and hit that subscribe button so you can miss out on any shows that are coming up here in the future. Um, I just think tripping. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell. Don't miss out on any shows coming up here in the future of the Gospel Truth. All right. So, I'm going to get out of here. May God bless you. And may God keep you. I am going.